Good morning and welcome to the committee's 21st meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent. We are going to move on to agenda item one, which is the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. This is the sift of two EU exit instruments as detailed on the agenda. The Scottish Government has allocated the negative procedure to both SSIs. Is the committee agreed that it is content with the parliamentary procedure allocated to these instruments by the Scottish Government? Yes. We are. Thank you. So we'll move on to agenda item two, which is the consideration of two negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. No motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to these instruments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? We are agreed. Therefore, we'll move on to agenda item three, and that is we have received consent notifications in relation to one UKSI on pesticides as detailed on the agenda. This instrument is being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Withdrawal Act. Does anyone have any comments on this? No. So the question I have for the committee is, does the committee agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for the consent for the UK SI referred to on in the notification be given? Yes. We, we, we are agreed. Now, the Cabinet Secretary is waiting outside, so I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow him to come in so we can move straight on to agenda item four. So the meeting is now suspended. Uh, thank you. I now reconvene this meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, and I could I just remind those people who've come in to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. Um, we now move on to agenda item four, which is the Transport Scotland Bill. Today we're consider, uh, continuing our consideration of stage two amendments to the Transport Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity and his supporting officials. I'd also like to welcome uh, the non-committee members present. Um, I'll explain briefly the procedure now for anyone who is watching. <clears throat> there will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and speak to all the other amendments in the group. I then will call on other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should catch my eye. If he has not already spoken to the group, I will then invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the agreement of other members to do so. If any member present objects, the committee immediately moves to vote on that amendment. If any member does not move does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Please note that any other member present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. I remind everyone that it is only committee members who are allowed to vote. Voting in any division is, is by a show of hands. And I would remind committee members to please keep their hands clearly raised 
until the clerk has recorded the vote. And clearly raised, I, I would suggest, is right up in the air rather than just that, because that makes it difficult for, for the clerks. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone will, will, will be looking around the table to make sure everyone else is voting as well. Mike. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, so I'll put a question on each section at the appropriate point. We will not go uh, beyond amendment to part five of the bill today. I'm now going to move to the first amendment. And we are on parking prohibitions enforcement. And I'd like to call Amendment 145 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, please, can you move Amendment 145 and speak to all the amendments in the group? Good morning, uh, convener. The uh, bill is introduced allows a person employed by a local authority or a person employed by a body with whom a local authority has made enforcement arrangements to issue penalty charge notices in connection with breach of the parking prohibitions. Amendment 145 is a technical amendment which will ensure that authorised enforcement officers can either be directly employed or appointed and engaged otherwise uh, under a contract of employment. Consmith Amendment 311 seeks to enable regulations to be made to exempt local authorities without decriminalised parking enforcement powers from the need to enforce the parking prohibition in the bill. Amendment 312 would then permit regulations to set out alternative arrangements for the enforcement of parking prohibition in the bill in those local authority areas. As this bill sets out national parking prohibitions that will apply consistently across Scotland, I do not consider it appropriate to take a power to make separate arrangements for those local authorities that have not yet applied for decriminalised parking enforcement powers. Such an approach would risk creating confusion and undermine the consistent national enforcement of these new prohibitions. It is also unclear from Amendment 312 what is intended by way of alternative enforcement arrangements for the non-DPE areas, or why the enforcement arrangements set out in the Bill may not be appropriate for local authorities without DPE. As I have previously stated, local authorities have the option to either contract enforcement via private companies or enter into an arrangement with a neighbouring local authority for the purposes of enforcement. Jimmy Green's Amendment 313 seeks to amend, say, amend Section 40, 54 of, uh, to state that when local authorities enter into arrangements with third parties in connection with the performance of any of the local authorities' functions regarding the issuing of penalty charges or enforcement and removing or uh, removing or moving or disposing vehicles, the local authority will still be responsible for those functions. This amendment is unnecessary as the Bill confers statutory duties upon local authorities. Although the Bill enables local authorities to contract out the performance of some of these duties to third parties, this does not in any way absolve the local authority from legal liability for their statutory obligations as a matter of basic legal principle. I therefore ask the Committee to support Amendment 145 in my name, and I would ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 133 and 132, and Jamie Green not to press Amendment 13, sorry, 313. Uh, if those amendments are pressed, I would urge the Committee to reject them, and I move Amendment 145. Thank you, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. I call on Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 311. Thank and you, any convener. other amendments in the group? Colin. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 311 in my name removes enforcement duties from councils who haven't decriminalised parking enforcement in areas without DPE. Councils will be required to enforce pavement parking, parking, in other words, just this one type of parking violation, without having the power to enforce any other. So they'll be able to ticket a car parked on a pavement, but not one parked on a double yellow line right next to it. In practical terms, some councils may have to set up an entirely new team specifically un to undertake this one task. This seems completely absurd, and it is my view that enforcement of pavement parking violations should be in line with enforcement of other parking violations. So, in areas with decriminalised parking enforcement, councils are responsible, and areas without, the police are. If the government's position is that any new offences should only be enforced by councils but not the police, then why are they not dealing with the issue of councils who have not decriminalised instead of simply creating this anomaly? Members will recall that the committee raised the issue of the onerous process councils face when it comes to decriminalising. 
Wise and Packin and urge the government to look at this process. I'm disappointed they haven't therefore in the brought anything forward. Therefore, in the absence of any action from the government, I have brought forward this amendment. With regards to Amendment 312, it is not clear if enforcement responsibilities would automatically fall to the police if removed from these councils. So, Amendment 312 simply allows the government to bring forward regulations clarifying this position, i.e. that enforcement should be carried out by the police. Thank you, Colin. I ask to call on Jamie Green now to speak to Amendment 313 and any other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Good morning, Government Secretary. Um, uh, my uh, short amendment, 313, I think the Cabinet Secretary in his opening comments uh, quite eloquently described its purpose and its intention. Um, I am pleased to hear the response uh, from the Cabinet Secretary that he feels that there is a strong enough legal basis that uh, local authorities are responsible for uh, the uh, uh, legal administration and responsibility of enforcement and that even uh, this really stemmed from a conversation I had around concerns around the contract contracting out of the enforcement to third party or organizations such as the case in private parking for example where uh, you know there, there's uh, perhaps some concerns around how these uh, processes might be administered so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that and I think on the on the back of the cabinet secretary's comments I'll would we'll, we'll withdraw that amendment, uh, given his assurances, and, and thank him for it. Uh, I, on the other uh, amendments in this group, briefly, 145, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, support the Cabinet Secretary on that. And Colin Smith's amendments raise a very interesting point, and I think we may get to discuss this later when I uh, bring up some other amendments around enforcement of, of, uh, of parking, uh, specifically around schools. But he does uh, raise a wider issue, and that's a conversation I hope we have at some point around who, uh, it's not a case of what is legal or, or not legal, but who enforces what and how easy it, is it for both uh, uh, wardens and decriminalised parking areas and the police to, to mutually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, administer uh, any regulations in this bill, whether it is par uh, pavement parking, uh, double parking or indeed uh, inconsiderate or obst obstructive parking. Uh, in our towns, and I think this has perhaps raised the wider issue. Um, so we will support, therefore, 311 and 312. Thank you, Jamie. No other member has indicated they wish to speak in this section. So, Cabinet Secretary, could you briefly wind up, please? Thank you, Just to uh, emphasise the point that the decision to de decriminalise the enforcement of parking within a uh, local authority area is a matter for the local authority to decide. As it stands at the present moment, uh, some 21 local authorities have decriminalised the process. Uh, another two are presently considering that approach. We would encourage the others to uh, continue to consider doing that. But it's entirely within their gift to be able to take this process forward, which is a fairly straightforward process for them uh, to do so. But it's important that we have a national consistency to the approach we take in these matters. And that's exactly what the amendment, uh, the amendment that I brought forward uh, seeks to do. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question, therefore, I have is that Amendment 145 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 146 in the name of Graham Simpson, but I think, Jamie Green, you want to say something on this. Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, I've spoken to Mr Simpson, uh, and given uh, the uh, apparent lack of support for his Amendment 115, uh, he will withdraw uh, all amendments uh, uh, in this part, including 146. I'm happy to name them if required, but otherwise just leave it at that. Okay, so they're not moved. Therefore, I'm going to call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, call Amendment 147 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 147 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, now is that Section 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We are now moving on to parking prohibition, penalty charges, application of penalty charges, and I'm going to call Amendment 310 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendments 314, 157 and 315. Jamie Green to move Amendment 3110 and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. These uh, uh, short amendments uh, deal with the, uh, the penalty charges which are raised uh, as a result of the prohibitions in, the, in this uh, part of the bill. Um, the first one, 310, uh, basically sets out the framework uh, of what I think how uh, local authorities uh, should use these uh, revenues for. Um, 
we did discuss this with low emission zones, and I think there was wide acceptance that any revenues raised from the low emission zones should be used and put towards good use. However, in the low emission zones, there was a structure for uh, setting objectives and that the revenues achieved would be linked to those objectives. I think that was the right approach that we, that we all agreed on in considering those amendments. Um, I think in this, section, this part of the bill, given that there is a lack of objectives to uh, the prohibitions of pave pavement and double parking, that therefore is, is nothing to peg uh, the responsibility of where that revenue goes to. Now, I have listed three categories and subsections, ABC, public transport services, roads and other transport infrastructure, to try and link it back to this, the theme and topic of transport, simply to um, ensure that local authorities do spend that money uh, on uh, improving public transport roads and transport infrastructure in the local authorities where the revenue is raised and it doesn't get sucked into a black hole of local authority financing. Uh, as perhaps is the case with other forms of, of levies uh, or, or charges introduced with regards to parking. Uh, that's really the main premise of it. 314 and 315 uh, I, were technical consequentials as a result of 310. And on 157, I believe we're happy to support the Cabinet Secretary's amendment there. That's all I'll say for now. Thanks. Jamie, uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 157 and other amendments in the group? Convener, Section 55 of the Bill enables Scottish Ministers to make regulations regarding the keeping of accounts by local authorities in connection with the enforcement of the parking prohibitions and about the purpose for which any surplus in those accounts may be used. Amendment 157 in my name is a technical provision ensuring that those regulations may make provision about the publication of statement of accounts. This ensures consistency in what the statements of accounts should contain and is also in keeping with the regulation making power for local authority accounts for low emission zones under section 22. Amendment 3110 in Jamie Green's uh, name would constrain how local authorities could use the income derived from enforcement of parking prohibitions in the bill, providing that this income can only be used in certain transport related purposes and around the local authorities area. And amendments 314 and 1315 would make related changes to ministers' powers to make regulations about local authorities' accounts, removing the power to specify in regulation how a surplus in a local authority account could be applied, and adding a new power for ministers to specify the information their accounts must contain as to how local authorities have complied with their duties under Amendment 310. I have sympathy with uh, what Jamie Green is seeking to achieve here. Indeed, in making regulations under Section 55 of the Bill, it would be my intention to specify that surplus on accounts connected with enforcement of parking prohibitions will be required to be used for specified transport-related purposes. In my view, the flexibility afforded by regulations is important to ensure that the transport purposes for which funds can be used are not drawn too narrowly and allow scope to respond to changing priorities. That said, I am happy to consider before stage three whether it can be made clearer on the face of the bill that the purposes for which uh, this can be specified in regulations are limited to transport-related purposes. As such, I would ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 310, 314 and 315, but if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them, and I would ask the committee to support Amendment 157 in my name. Thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I'm out of step with all my political colleagues and almost everybody in the Parliament in that, as a matter of principle, I oppose hypothecation. Um, and the reason for that is I believe that uh, where funds are uh, raised or penalties are implied for public purposes, um, that's perfectly proper. When funds are spent, they should be allocated to purposes that serve a public purpose, quite regardless of where the money may come from. There is a practical issue about hypothecation as well, which would apply in this particular case, uh, as it would in others, and that is the success of penalty charges should lead to their raising no revenue whatsoever. 
Therefore, that impoverishes the practical purpose to which one is hypothecating the money. And I think that's always a practical difficulty. But I do understand that the introduction of hypothecation in policy areas generally often leads to that being a lever to persuade the general public that the policy intention is a good one because the money will be spent for good purposes. I'm no objection to charges being made for services rendered, of course. Having said all that, Convener, I'm, I'm not intending to make an issue of it when we come to make our decisions, but I, but I do think as a matter of permanent objection to hypothecation, I always feel uncomfortable about this sort of thing and will continue to do so, but recognise there's probably only two other people in the entire parliament agree with me. Okay, um, Stuart, thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, th thank, thank you, Convener. Um, th can I thank Mr Stevenson for his comments? I'm still entirely unclear if he supports my amendments or not, following his comments. It's very early in the morning to talk about hypothecation of policy, but I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is uh, all over this. So um, I think uh, I appreciate the, the feedback, actually. Um, I said th these, these uh, amendments were meant uh, earnestly in good faith to try and, I think, as Mr Stevenson alluded to, uh, give the public a general message that, um, that the revenues that will be achieved from uh, any such prohibitions will be put to good use. And I think that's an important point, as we discuss with the emission zones, to take the public with us on this uh, positive journey to improve uh, uh, driver behaviour. Um, indeed, it's, it's important that they see what the consequence of that behaviour is, both for financial penalty point of view, but also um, where that revenue might be spent. Um, I, I appreciate also that when you put prescriptive lists on the face of a bill, uh, in terms of how money can be spent, it may come across as a constraint. That, that of course, isn't the intention, but there is an intention to focus, narrow focus, uh, uh, the uh, guidance of how that money will be spent, if the Cabinet Secretary is willing to, or, and his team, to discuss uh, with me and others um, before Stage 3 how we could use the bill itself to uh, strengthen that reinforcement so it's not just up to the whim of regulation, because, again, we haven't seen what that regulation may state, so it's hard to tell if it, if it meets the needs of, of the intention of this amendment. Um, I, my office and I would be very happy to have a productive conversation about how we can come up with some words to that effect at stage three, and that premise would not move 310. Thank you. Uh, as Jamie Graham wishes to um, uh, withdraw Amendment 310, uh, I have to ask if any member wishes to object. No one wishes to object, um, therefore the amendment is withdrawn. I would normally call Amendment 148 in the name of Graham Simpson, but I believe that's not moved, Mr Green. Is that right? That is correct. I therefore, call Amendment 149 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 149 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We then move on to uh, accessibility of information on parking prohibitions and penalty charges. And I'm going to call Amendment one, 217 in the name of Paulie McNeill, group with Amendment 218. Paulie McNeill, can you move Amendment 217 and speak to the other amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. And yes, I'll move the Amendment 217 in my name. It was recently drawn to my attention in Glasgow that our parking penalty notices lack plain English in relation to the reference of the right to challenge and appeal of the notice. The right of appeal and the right to challenge any decision is a central requirement of any system. The public are suspicious that local authorities are driven by revenue considerations um, when tickets are issued. So local authorities who issue parking notices through enforcement should not should not be perceived as purely a revenue issue and in all fairness they should design a system which makes it relatively easy for those who believe that they are able to challenge their notice are able to do so. Um, I do have, I've gone through all of the uh, visuals that I can get and I'm happy to share this with the uh, Cabinet Secretary just to illustrate my point, um, which is when a parking notice is issued it's all geared towards payment methods, there's a tiny little bit of the small print which says um, notice to owner will be described how to make formal representations regarding the issue of the penalty notice. Uh, certainly, I do recall in days gone by that your grounds of appeal would be also be published. It would be a bit clearer. 
Um, I've gone through the various stages as far as I can get to look at the screens, and nowhere does it say um, that you have the right to appeal and challenge. It's all geared towards payment. And I just think, uh, in a sense, I I'm probing this issue because I hope the Cabinet Secretary may be with me on the point of making it relatively easy for people to see what their, their rights are. Um, I had my researchers check the website to see how uh, easy they found it to find out how to appeal. Um, the evidence I found, it wasn't really that easy to find out. It was, it was there, but it wasn't really up front. And I just think that um, it is the right to challenge a decision by a public body, even if it's a parking notice. It's a fundamental right. And Amendment 218 is about making sure that that information is accessible to those with any um, disability. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Mike Rumbles, you'd like to say something. Th thank you, Convener. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, Pauline McNeill, and perhaps you could address this point in summing up. I uh, absolutely agree with 217, and, um, in two, but 218, in practical, I mean, I'm just wondering in practical terms, when it says regulations must include provision requiring that notification of a penalty charge, is available in formats that are accessible to individuals who have a mental disability. How, if you could just tell us in summing up how that would happen, because I don't it's not quite clear what we're asking for here. Okay, maybe we could come to that in the uh, summing up. Um, no other members indicate they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 217 and 218 from Paul McNeill seek to introduce a requirement that regulations associated with the enforcement of the parking prohibitions must ensure that penalty charge notices contain information on how, an how to appeal and are available in different formats that are accessible to individuals who have a sensory, physical or mental disability. I recognise the importance of making sure that the process of enforcement and appeals, including the information contained in penalty charge notices, is both clear and transparent for everyone. I'm happy to confirm on the record today that the regulations that are to be made will make provision regarding reviews and appeals, including the grounds of, of review or appeal in connection with the imposition of a penalty charge. The design of the penalty charge notice, which is currently used by 21 local authorities in Scotland, already provides information to the motorists on how to appeal against the issuing of the penalty charge notice and what happens thereafter. It is intended that the regulations made under Section 491 of the Bill will make provision to ensure that the content of penalty charge notices for these parking prohibitions contains similar information, and therefore do not consider that Amendment 217 is therefore necessary. In relation to Amendment 218, the regulations will also make provision about the notification of a penalty charge, including the form content and method of notification, and there is ample flexibility in that regulation-making power in Section 491 to ensure that accessibility requirements are taken into account in that regard. In addition to that, the Committee will be aware that under the Equality Act 2010, local authorities must make reasonable adjustments to remove barriers which may discriminate against disabled people. Such reasonable adjustments would already include ensuring that penalty notice charges are available in accessible formats such as large font or in Braille. I note also that the 2010 Act already contains clear definitions of what is meant by a disability, whereas Amendment 218 does not. I therefore ask Paul McNeill not to press Amendment 217 or 218, but if they are pre pressed, I would ask the Committee not to support these amendments. <coughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask Pauline McNeill to wind up, please, Pauline? Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Mike Rumbles for his question. Uh, the amendment was really essentially driving at what the Cabinet Secretary has outlined as trying to identify mainly sensory or disability impairments that might make it difficult for someone to understand exactly how to go through the process. Um, I'm content, Convener, with the Cabinet Secretary's response to that, and, and I'm pleased that that has been addressed further in the Bill. So, uh, and therefore, I will not be pressing my amendments. Thank you, Pauline. As Pauline McNeill wishes to withdraw Amendment uh, 217, I have to ask, does any member wish to object? No. No member wishes to object, therefore the, the amendment is withdrawn. Um, <clears throat>
I therefore call Amendment 218 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 217. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not move. Amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 311 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 145. <coughs> Excuse me. Colin Smith to move or not move? <coughs> move, convener. The question, therefore, is Amendment 311 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Therefore, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There were five votes for and six votes against, therefore Amendment 311 is not agreed. I call Amendment 312 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 145. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move, convener. Okay. The question, therefore, is that Section 49 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I call Amendment 150 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 115, but understand it is not moved. Not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 151 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 151 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 152 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 59. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 152 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now is that Section 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 153 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 115, but I understand this is not moved. Not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 154 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question, therefore, be, is that Amendment 154 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, now is that Section 51 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 155 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 115, uh, and understand this is not moved. Correct, not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 156 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 156 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question, therefore, is that Section 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is Section 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, I call an Amendment 313 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 145. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move, convener. The question, therefore, is Section 54 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 314 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 310. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 157 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 310. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? Moved. The question is that Amendment 157 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 315 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 310. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. The question, therefore, is Section 55 be agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. jumping the gun there, or, or just catching you out. The question, therefore, is that Section 56 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore, we're going to move on to parking prohibitions and the guidance, and I'd like to call Amendment 158 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary, to move the amendment and speak to it, please. Convener, Section 57 requires local authorities to have regard to ministerial guidance in exercising their functions under Part 4 of the Bill. The purpose of Amendment 158 is simply to clarify that this parking standards guidance will apply to local authorities regardless of whether the functions were conferred on them in their capacity as local authorities or as a traffic authority. Upon reflection following the Bill's introduction, we have deemed that it would be prudent to put this beyond doubt, and I therefore move Amendment 158. No other, amendment has, uh, no other member has uh, indicated they wish to speak to this amendment, so Cabinet Secretary, I am not going to ask you to wind up because you say you don't want to, and I'm going to move straight to the question, and, and that is that Amendment 158 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that Section 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 159 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 159 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
I call Amendment 160 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 122. Cabinet Secretary, can you move formally, please? Moved. The question is, Amendment 160 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 161 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 115, but understand that this is not to be moved. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 162 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary, to move and speak to this amendment, please. Convener, Amendment 162 is a technical amendment that seeks to ensure that if a local authority is considering exempting a pavement from the pavement parking prohibition or looking to place a traffic sign or approved device, they should only do so with the consent or in conjunction with the relevant traffic authority, should it not be them. I move. Uh, this removes any ambiguity in this area, and I therefore move Amendment 162. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No other members have indicated they wish to speak. So, Cabinet Secretary, I'm assuming you don't want to wind up. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 162 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that Section 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call them, uh, we're moving on to, sorry, parking on a cycle track. And I'd like to call Amendment 163 in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith to move and speak to Amendment 163, please. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to move Amendment 163 in my name, uh, which looks at addressing an issue arising from the decriminalisation of parking enforcement, which has been raised with me by a number of local councils. Last week at Committee, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that parking in cycle lanes is banned under the 1984 Roads Act, but there is a, a problem with the enforcement of the ban. When a mandatory cycle lane has been introduced without a TRO, enforcement cannot be decriminalised. In practical terms, this means that often only the police are able to enforce this ban, even in areas with decriminalised parking enforcement, where the council would enforce other parking offences. This is a clear anomaly. Parking in cycle lanes is a hazard, and it's right that it's banned, but this ban is meaningless if it isn't properly enforced. While I appreciate enforcement can be decriminalised through the use of a TRO, this places a significant burden on councils simply to give them the power to enforce something that is already prohibited. This amendment seeks to address this by allowing local authorities to issue civil fines on this ban. I have suggested regulations here, but I am happy to discuss alternative approaches if members believe there is a different way of achieving the same aim. Thank you, Colin. Jamie Green, you want to speak briefly on this? Yeah, yeah, very briefly. Um, I tried to submit a very similar amendment, uh, and the legislation team advised that Mr Smith had beat me to it. Uh, 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 so, um, for that reason, I'm very happy to support this amendment, but I appreciate that if it's technically not the way to approach the issue, uh, I'd be happy to work with other parties and the Cabinet Secretary on a suitable wording. If, if Mr Smith is minded not to move, I wouldn't push the amendment. But he does raise a very important point. Um, parking on cycle tracks and cycle lanes has become a, an issue. We, we spoke about this uh, at length um, and how we address that uh, through regulation. And to use the Transport Bill as a method of doing so, I think, is an important point to raise. It's something I think we probably all share concern over, but it's just a case of how we go about making sure that uh, that practice is properly addressed. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will enlighten us. And no other member wishes to speak, so Cabinet Secretary, over to you. Uh, Convener, Amendment 163 calls for a new part of the bill which relates to parking on a cycle track. Whilst I appreciate the intention behind Colin Smith's amendment to encourage more active travel, in my view, this amendment is not required. Colin Smith's amendment is seeking to amend the Roads Scotland Act 1984 by inserting a new subsection 6A into section 129 of the Act to confer powers on local authorities to issue fixed penalty notices on motorists who park on a cycle track. However, this is an unnecessary amendment as parking on a cycle track is already a criminal offence under section 1296 of the 1984 Act. If a local authority themselves wishes to change drive, charge drivers for parking on cycle lanes, it can do so by obtaining decriminalised parking enforcement powers. Currently, 21 local authorities have these powers, can and can do, uh, and they can undertake enforcement restrictions on cycle tracks. It's also, I also note for completeness that there are some technical difficulties with this amendment in that it seeks to place this regulation-making power within section 129 of the Roads Scotland Act, Act which deals with miscellaneous summary offences, despite the fact that the amendment does not seek to create a new offence. 
It instead seeks to enable regulations to be made which can confer a power on local authorities to charge motorists. Furthermore, the amendment refers to fixed penalty notices, but these can only be issued in Scotland by the Procurator Fiscal or a police constable, and they are backed with a power of criminal prosecution if unpaid. The appropriate term for a local authority charge is a penalty charge notice. Even if these technical difficulties were resolved, however, I consider the proposed amendment to be unrequired, given the powers already exist in both criminal and civil law. Can I therefore I'd ask Goldsmith not to press amendment 13163. However, if pressed, I'd ask the committee to reject it. Did Jimmy Green wish to make an intervention? If I could. Thank you. Happy to take this point. Yeah, it, it, it's so, are, is, are you confirming that any form of parking on any form of cycle line where it, it has not been allowed via a decriminalised process by a local authority is enforceable by either a police officer or a traffic warden in decriminalised parking areas? And does that include both uh, advisory cycle lanes and more statutory formal types of cycle lanes? No, if it's a, to be clear, if it's um, if it's in an area which has not been decriminalised, then it's a matter for the police to enforce it. And they have criminal uh, law powers in order to deal with that. If it's in a decriminalised area, then it is for the local authority to take it forward uh, to that process. However, local authorities also have a responsibility to make sure that they have TROs in place for the enforcement of this, which is a legal requirement to make the uh, provision enforceable in law. And that's why local authorities have to put a TRO in place in order to be able to issue uh, a, a fixed charge notice. Colin, I'm going to ask you to wind up and, and maybe push that question a bit more during that process. I Thank, thank you very much, Convener. I, I think that the Cabinet Secretary has missed the point of this particular amendment, and I'm happy for him to intervene to clarify the position. But it's my clear understanding, and certainly been raised by a number of local authorities, that they cannot, where they have decriminalised parking, they cannot enforce that unless they have passed a TRO. Now, a TRO is not required for a mandatory cycle lane, as far as I'm aware. Um, however, if they haven't passed a TRO, um, then they cannot enforce. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take an intervention on that. Yeah. For them to enforce any provision under the decriminalised arrangements, they have to have a TRO in place. They have to have a legal basis in which to actually enforce that penalty. You can't have a provision where they simply can issue uh, uh, fixed penalty charges for anything that they choose to, to, uh, to consider that they want to issue a fixed penalty charge. There needs to be a legal basis in which for that to be uh, provided. So uh, there, the, the, there is no way getting around that. Uh, you need to have a provision in place that uh, gives them the power to be able to issue uh, the fixed charge notice for that particular obstruction on a cycleway or where it's on a, uh, an area uh, of the street which they're parking on, which they have a TRO in place. So it's a it's a part that they can't get round, they have to put in place to make it enforceable. Thank, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. And, and herein lies the anomaly. The government currently allows a local authority to introduce a mandatory cycle lane without a TRO, but then says, unless you have a TRO, you cannot enforce that cycleway. So, uh, I, give way? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But is, is the point not that if the, t if the local authority cannot enforce, then the police can enforce, so somebody can enforce? And, and therefore there is the anomaly that we have a situation where everything else in a, in, in a local authority area um, where it's been decriminalised uh, is a matter for the council, except for cycle lanes. And, and the question is, uh, just let me finish, if you let me just finish the point, um, I think the question that the government needs to answer is that why does it allow a local authority to have a mandatory cycle lane without a TRO if the government are saying that you have to have a TRO in order to enforce a penalty for parking in the cycle lane? I, I, I think we're confusing an issue here, and that is the need for the councils to have a TRO in place in order to be able to enforce a fixed charge notice. They need to put that in place. Uh, uh, for a cycle lane, if it's an advisory, uh, then they don't have to have a TRO in place, but if it's obstructed, then clearly there's an issue where the police uh, could actually deal with that through criminal law. But where it's been decriminalised, they need to have a TRO in place. Uh, that's how the process works, that's how it operates. There is, no, there is no way around that particular process. So if they don't have a, they don't have a TRO in place for a, a parking restriction at schools, then effectively they could be in a position where they can't actually legally enforce um, a fixed charge notice. 
Colin, I'm going to come back to you to, to, to continue winding up and then to enlarge the information given to you by the Cabinet Secretary Press or, or, or withdraw your amendment. Colin. Yeah, th th thanks very much, Convener. I mean, th th this, this, co this committee has heard on a number of occasions the, 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 the challenges of TRO process for local authorities. Indeed, it was one of the, the explanations given by the government to, to knock back the 20-mile-an-hour bill that they would look at the, the enforcement of this. I mean, the reality is, with or without a TRO, parking in a mandatory cycle lane is banned. But as it stands, this can't be enforced by councils, even in areas with decriminalised parking enforcement, without a TRO. So I think there is an anomaly here. Um, I'm happy not to move um, the amendment at this stage, hoping that we can discuss um, a way forward on that, but I obviously reserve the right to bring this back at uh, stage three uh, if those issues are not, are not addressed, because they are concerns that local councils have raised, uh, and I hope the government will take that on board. OK, thank you, Colin. Uh, just to confirm, therefore, Colin Smith wishes to withdraw Amendment 163. Does any member object? Um, therefore, the amendment is withdrawn. <clears throat> We now move on to working place parking and the establishment of re and review of licensing schemes. I am going to call amendment number seven in the name of John Finney Group with other amendments as shown in the grouping. I would like to point out to, to members that if amendment 8E is agreed, I cannot call amendment 8A. And if amendment 8B is agreed, I cannot call amendment 8G. And if Amendment 8G is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 8C, all due to preemptions. It will all become clearer when we get to it. I am therefore going to call John Finney to move Amendment 7 and speak to the um, other amendments in the group. John. Uh, many thanks, Convener. I am very pleased to speak to my amendments in the Workplace Park and Levy. As you will be aware, over the past few months there has been a lot of coverage on this issue, much of it ill-informed. So, as we consider the amendments today, I think it is important to focus on what the amendments do and the positive benefits that the Workplace Park and Levy can yield. But let's take a step back. We're facing a, a climate emergency, so we need as many tools available as possible to address this. No one is saying the workplace parking levies will do this alone, but it is clear that there will be need to be as many levers available as possible. We also have an issue that local authorities need tools to manage transport in their areas and to raise the revenue to help them do this. My amendments are based on the principles of localism. It will be for local authorities to determine if they wish to implement a workplace park and levy, and there is no requirement to do so. I will pick up the details of the proposals when I speak to subsequent amendments, but I would like to pick up on some key points. This is a power, not a duty. It empowers local authorities to act and make decisions locally. These decisions have to be made within a framework set by primary legislation, regulations and guidance. This framework has a key underpinning of requirements of consultation, local impact assessment and investment of funds raised from the levy into local transport projects identified in a local transport strategy. And fundamentally, the proposals address issues that we all agree need to be addressed. The First Minister has declared a climate emergency and we recognise transport's role in this. Turning to the detail of, of my amendments, Amendment 7 together with Amendment 9, permits local authorities to put in place a licensing scheme requiring any person providing workplace parking at their premises to hold a licence and to pay charges under that licence by reference to the number of parking places provided. This is a premises-based levy. Local authorities who wish to introduce a licensing scheme for workplace parking must have a local transport strategy and must consider that introducing the levy will facilitate the achievement of policies in that strategy. One of the criticisms of workplace parking levy is that it is simply a money-raising measure. This is not the case. The link to a local transport strategy means a levy can only be introduced with a clearly articulated strategic context. I beg your pardon, within a clearly articulated strategic context. Amendment 8 defines what constitutes a workplace parking place. Workplace parking places will be identified by, a refer by reference to the reason for parking and to who is parking. A workplace parking place will accordingly be a parking place at any premises which is occupied for the purpose of attending a place where the person providing that parking place carries out a business. Business has a wide meaning, encompassing not only carrying out any trade, profession, vocation or undertaking, but also the provision of education and the exercise of public functions. 
only parking for business purposes, including parking by workers, agents and suppliers of the person providing the parking place, is covered. Parking is in purely a personal capacity, such as shopping at a local supermarket, is not. The amendment also gives Scottish ministers a power to vary these provisions by regulation. This is a necessary flexibility to respond to changing and future circumstances. Amendment 10 is really important as it sets out the detailed requirements for consultation in a proposed scheme and impact assessments. There's been criticism of the lack of consultation on the proposal and the fact that there has been no uh, impact assessment. I, I welcome the work that the committee has done with the evidence sessions and the online survey, and it was really interesting to hear nuanced and balanced arguments from a range of views, most certainly here. Yeah. For giving way. Um, on this point of consultation, um, can you just clarify and maybe confirm that uh, so if we, we're only enabling this legislation and th therefore a council, if, it, if we do pass the legislation, would have to then go through its own process. So Glasgow or any other council would then do its own consultation on exactly what they were going to do. Is, is that correct? Th that's correct. And I will come on to that. Okay. Thank you. The amendment underpins the reality of the consultative nature of these proposals. There are strong duties on local authorities to, to consult on a scheme not just a proposed scheme, but if they wanted to amend or revoke a scheme. There has to be clarity on the objectives of a scheme, the area in which it will cover, exemptions, what people can expect to pay, what the funds will be used on, and how it will address the objectives set out in the local transport strategy. And there has to be an impact assessment on those who may have to pay charges and on the environment. Amendment 11 gives the Scottish Ministers the power to make regulations about the procedures to make, amend and revoke workplace parking schemes. Amendment 12 gives Scottish Ministers and local authorities the power to have a local inquiry into proposals to make, amend or revoke workplace parking uh, levy schemes. I very much see this as a tool to be used if needed, rather than as a regular part of the development of a workplace parking levy. The amendment also requires that a local authority has to await the completion of the inquiry before implementing any proposal. Something you might imagine self-evident, but it's important to sp spell that out in the legislation. Amendments 13 and 14 allow licensing scheme to set out procedural matters in relation to grant and issue of licenses, license conditions, and so on, and specify what must and may be included in license. licenses. Um, turning to, to amendments 7A, 7B, 7C, 7D, um, scope and co content of the licensing schemes. Um, can we now, uh, to, uh, now turn to, to these amendments and, and start with um, colleague Mike Rumbles with his amendment 7A seeks to ensure that licenses are only required in order to provide more than 10 working parking places. I don't think this is appropriate uh, to be as restrictive as this on the face of the bill. Local authorities may in their schemes as Nottingham did in theirs, decide that people providing below a specified number of parking places should be exempt. But whether it is appropriate and what the number should be is best determined with regard to local circumstances. There should also be a flexibility to change that number as and when appropriate. Pauline McNeill's amendments 7b and 7c are concerned with specifying particular assessments around displacement, impacts on poverty and implications for workers that a local authority should carry out in advance of a scheme. My Amendment 10 require, requires that before making, amending or revoking a scheme, a local authority should prepare and publish an assessment of the impacts of the proposal, specifically on persons who may have to pay charges and on the environment. I believe this addresses the aim Polly and McNeil's, uh, of Polly McNeill's amendments. Peter Chapman's Amendment 7D would require a scheme to be reviewed annually. On the face of it, this amendment looks to be a, a simple tweak to improve accountability, but under my amendment, local authorities will have to set out how they will review the operation and effectiveness of the scheme, and I'm minded to let local authorities make that decision. Amendments, <coughs> excuse me, amendments 8E, 8A, 8F, 8B, 8G, 8C, 8H, 8H and 8D, excuse me, definition of work, um, workplace parking places. Mike Rumble's amendments um, 8A and 8C are intended to leave out the definition of workplace parking 
any parking by, um, by what is referred to in the amendment as a quote, business customer. These are people who are, who in the course of their business park at the premises of another business of whom they are a client or customer. An example might be a property developer parking for a meeting with their accountant. Perhaps Mr Rumble's concern is that this might catch people parking at supermarkets to pick up their shopping. Um, um, and I've covered that earlier, so I hope that concern has um, been addressed. This is about parking in the course of business only. It's not clear to me what uh, Mike Rumbles is seeking to achieve with his Amendment 8b. If his intention is to remove parking by students and others attending education or training courses, then this amendment will not have the effect because they would still be part of a definition of a workplace parking place in subsection 1 of my Amendment 8. But in any event, there is no obvious reason why students should not be required to park in towns or city where these levies are introduced. Indeed, young people are a key demographic that we should be encouraging to adopt active and sustainable models of transport. Dean Lockhart's Amendment 8e has the effect of restricting the definition of workplace parking to parking by workers and members of bodies whose affairs are controlled by their members. This would mean that charges couldn't be levied uh, for parking by agents or suppliers of a business, business customers or visitors, or people attending a course of education or training. The question I would have to ask is why we should exclude these groups. It may be of concern that business customer, um, it may be a concern again that business customer covers people parking in a local supermarket, but I say again that's simply not the case. <laughs> Dean Lockhart's Amendment F removes parking provided by a third party from the definition of workplace parking. In practice, this would mean if a company leases spaces in another premises provided to provide workplace parking, that no charges would be payable. Again, the question is why. If it not only against the spirit of the proposal, but it could create a massive loophole. Amendments 8G and H H 8H are concerned with definitions. The effect of 8G removes definitions of business, business customer, business visitor and government department. This is similar to Mike Rumble's Amendment 8E, but also appears to exclude parking at premises used by government departments and other public bodies. This appears to be very unfair. What principal reason should they be exempting uh, such bodies from the levy others have to pay? And I do wonder if this was the intention of the amendment. Amendment 8H modifies the definition of a worker and would mean that a charge arising from a screed could only be applied in respect of parking by permanent full-time workers. Aside from being against the spirit of the scheme, it creates potential loopholes and provides a potential incentive for employers not to offer full-time contracts so as to avoid paying the levy. And again, surely that isn't the intention. Mike Rumble's Amendment 8D removes Scottish Minister's powers by regulation to alter the circumstances in which workplace um, is provided. In practice, this would mean that categories set out in Amendment 8 were fixed and couldn't later be adjusted if need be, depending on experience from how schemes are operating without primary legislation. Regulations are subject to scrutiny by Parliament and Amendment 8D would make the scheme inflexible. Amendments 9A, 9B, 9C, 9D. Um, John Mason's Amendment 9A is an interesting one. Uh, by seeking to extend the powers to make a workplace parking licence scheme to a, a regional transport uh, uh, partnership, it recognises that transport par patterns and issues are not set by local authority boundaries. That's why my amendment allow for joint working by local authorities. Do you remember that point? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much much for giving way. Does he see any role for RTPs? Because, I mean, we had the example uh, that Colin Smith gave of, you know, people coming from one area into a city, paying the, the um, fee, and that the, but where they came from maybe wouldn't benefit. And we also had the idea of park and ride in Nottingham, where the park and ride might be in a separate local authority area. So would that just be a voluntary process? Would, would he not see the RTP as having any role in that? Um, I think in any case they have an overarching role with regard to their constituent parts, if you like, but the, the scheme is very clear that my amendments would allow for joint working by local authorities, um, and I, I believe that better approaches this because there, there are uh, unintended consequences of RTPs. Mm -hmm. And allowing powers to be exercisable concurrently by local authorities and RTPs could additionally give rise to the potential for confusion and indeed duplication, which none of us want. 
Um, Mike Rumble's amendment C attempts to make a precondition that a local authority can only make a scheme if it is satisfied that there are adequate public transport services in an area. Superficially, that looks attractive, but it falls down in a number of ways. Uh, how does one define adequate public transport? And fundamentally, improving public transport may be the objective in the local transport strategy that the scheme is being set up to support. And fundamentally, the focus should be on local decision making. Um, I've just brief comments. I've got a number to, to go, Camina. I appreciate this is time consuming. I, I'm, I'm being patiently listening, John. C c continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Colin Smith's Amendment 9b would make ministerial approval a precondition of a scheme. This goes against the very principle of localism that scheme is founded on. I believe the power of local accountable decision-making is important, and that underpins my amendments. Jamie Green's Amendment 9d seeks to impose a whole number of conditions on a, on a scheme. These range from constraints to making of a scheme through to restrictions on how the scheme operates. The amendment is a classic case of unnecessary micromanagement. What is wrong with local authorities making decisions on the basis of impact assessments and full consultation? Jamie Green's Amendment 10D calls for a range of reports to be prepared by the local authority. My Amendment 10 in subsection 4 already requires an assessment on the effects of persons who may have to pay the charges and on the environment. I can't see what Amendment 10D adds to this. Colin Smith's Amendment 10A requires local authorities to hold a referendum on whether proposed workplace parking licence schemes should proceed, and 10B gives Scottish Ministers the power to make provision about the franchise, conduct and administration of a referendum. I have to ask Colin Smith why he has so little faith in our local authorities. Under my amendments, local authorities will have to consult on the scheme, and they are, as we are, subject to the referendum of the ballot box. Jamie Green's Amendment 10A requires the statement of scheme objectives, says how the, the um, authority will use the net proceeds of the scheme. My Amendment 10 in subsection 3, subsection C, already requires a local authority to set out how it intends to apply the net proceeds of a scheme, so this would be an unnecessary duplication. Jamie Green's Amendment 10F and Peter Chapman's Amendment 10G both seek to add specific assessment categories that a local authority must carry out. Jamie Green's requires this assessment for local businesses and island communities. Peter Chapman's amendment also requires for local business and island communities, as well as local authority revenue, schools, public bodies and other statutory bodies and health boards. The requirement to carry out an assessment of those affected by the levy is already there in my amendment, and it's not clear to me what these amendments add. Mike Rimble's um, Amendment 10C requires an assessment of the effects of a proposed scheme on the displacement of vehicles and the resulting effect of residents in or near the area to which the proposed scheme relates. This is an important issue, one I would expect to be picked up by the assessment of the scheme proposals on the environment, which my al amendment already requires. Amendment 12B from Jamie Green would allow the Scottish Parliament, by a majority vote, to cause a local inquiry to be held into a proposal for a workplace parking licensing scheme. But my view, again, is that local, this is a local authority matter, best dealt with at local authority level, and we need to respect that. Amendment 13A from Jamie Green appears to do two things. By removing power from Scottish ministers, the power for Scottish ministers to require or permit licensing schemes to make provisions about reviews of and appeals against decisions in relation to workplace parking licences, and there would be no provision for such reviews and appeals. The second thing is that it removes the offence of intentionally providing false or misleading information in or in connection with licence applications. This means there would be no specific offence directed at fraudulent statements in licence applications. And again, uh, I have to ask, does Jamie Green really want to remove rights of appeal and encourage fraudulent statements? Jamie Green's 14A seeks to remove the requirement uh, that workplace parking licences specify the maximum number of vehicles so that may be parked at the premises subject to that licence. This is important for establishing licensing requirements. But local authorities will have to do this in order to run a scheme as a key part of establishing the charge due. This would cut across that, and as such, I cannot support that amendment. Jamie Green's Amendment 318 introduces a power for local authority residents to petition the local authority for a, a review of a work place parking licensing scheme, where a petition is signed by more than 20% of residents in an area, the authority must carry out the review. But in practice, what, 
what does this represent? The amendment appears to be trying to open up another front in the campaign against workplace parking levies. My proposals are founded on principles of localism, underpinned by consultation, requirements to carry out impact assessments, and fundamentally, the ballot box. I believe that these are the fundamentals that we should be guided by. With those factors underpinning workplace parking schemes, this amendment is at best unnecessary and at worst a way of, for a minority to frustrate the successful operation of such schemes by local authorities. Convener, that addresses all the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 7. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Finney. And uh, just by my calculations, and, and I understand you had a lot of uh, ground to cover, that if we all take a similar time, we'll, we'll be uh, not finished before the planning uh, session this afternoon. So, bearing in mind that Mr Finney was, was introducing a, a major amendment, I, there was a certain amount of leeway. If I could ask members to remember that other members wish to speak and therefore their contributions um, should be as concise as they can make them. And on that basis, I call Mr Rumbles to move Amendment 7A. Mike. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, very brief, I'm disappointed what I've heard from John Finney because there are some very constructive amendments here which he's opposing them all. Um, I just want to make a brief comment 7A, I'm trying to avoid uh, the risk of judicial review of this legislation because I'm very well aware that in planning law, um, a change of use or other um, uh, issues with planning, there is a requirement to have workplace parking. If we approve this unamended, then I do genuinely believe there is a real risk of judicial review, especially for smaller companies um, with, with the supplies to. On my no, on my um, on 8A, it's all very well for John Finney to say, "Oh, business customer doesn't include supermarket customers." Ah, we've got John Finney's word for that. But we're making the law, and the law says. <laughs> It includes business customers, the customers of a business. So what this I'm trying to do is remove that so we don't charge customers of supermarkets and everything else. So we only have John's word for that, but we actually have to look at the law that we are making. Um, I won't say much more, except that I find it completely amazing that John Finney does not wish to accept my Amendment 9C. The whole purpose of his amendment, the whole purpose of it, is 9C. That the local authority proposing to make the scheme is satisfied there is an adequate level of public transport service in the area. That is the point of John Finney's amendment. And if you want my amendment to do that, it makes this whole thing a farce. No, because I've finished speaking. Thank you. Thank you. My, I'm now going to call Peter Chapman to speak to Amendment 7D and any other amendments in the group he wishes to. Thank you, Convener. And very briefly, my Amendment 7D simply means that if a workplace parking levy is to be introduced, there must be a review done annually on it. I think this is important to assess the impact it is having on the local workforce and employers. And I don't believe it's sufficient to allow local authorities to decide when and if they will review uh, the, uh, what the WPL is, is achieving. I think that allows far too much leeway. So I think an annual assessment is correct. Uh, my other amendment, 10G, uh, just simply outlines various bodies which must be consulted on before a local authority can prepare and publish on a workplace parking levy. And I think, that, again, this is uh, a very relevant and uh, modest uh, 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 amendment that I would wish that would, would be, both would be supported. Thank you, Peter. I now call Pauline McNeill to speak to amendments 7B and other amendments in the group. Pauline. Thank you, Convener. Um, Amendment 7b, this seeks to ensure, similarly to McRumble's, that an assessment on the parking levy and parking in the surrounding area is taken into account. This was the experience of Nottingham, that there was a considerable amount of displaced uh, traffic as a result of the parking levy. If such an, undertaking, I mean, if such an assessment is not undertaking, then it can have a quite a serious impact on local people. I mean, yes. I, I mean, I just want, wonder if the member f why the member feels that needs to be specifically in. Because, I mean, for, if you take a city like Glasgow, when they introduce, say, um, parking meters, 
uh, they would be looking at knock-on effect in the surrounding area, same with the, around the parking around the stadia. So does she not think that we can trust Glasgow to look at the knock-on effects? Here we go. Um, can we trust Glasgow? Um, well, lots of communities don't want extra uh, traffic orders on their communities. It's a choice for them. So I think that it isn't just a simple question of a local authority like Glasgow saying, well, in order to stop displaced traffic, we'll just impose some restrictions on local communities. So, uh, yeah, I think it's... Um, uh, it's a probing amendment. I'm sure the member will appreciate it at this stage. It's one of the issues that Nottingham did come up, so it's quite a legitimate one to probe, I would suggest, for the committee. Amendment 7C seeks to ensure that an assessment um, of the parking levy uh, on poverty in the surrounding area is considered and taking into account. In what poverty remains a serious problem, 182,000 children in Scotland live in poverty despite having one person in their household in work. Um, as the committee have listened to in the evidence session, many people rely on their cars to get to work uh, and many poor people rely on their cars to get to work because public transport, even in Glasgow, is expensive. A quarter of people living on the periphery of the city already have to catch at least two buses to work. So you can see um, if you have a car at your disposal, it's uh, an easy choice um, to make. Ten th tens of thousands of people will not be able to afford any more in their cost of living if the levy is passed on. It will result in people... I don't believe it will result in people getting out of their cars um, because public transport, even in Glasgow, um, isn't good enough. And the connectivity report recently produced acknowledges this very fact that we need significant investment even in Scotland's largest city. Uh, if passed, um, legislators, I think it's perfectly acceptable for legislators like us to provide the broad framework, even if this has passed the law, and that should include principles that we believe local authorities should adopt, such as a poverty impact assessment. As a legislator, I came here to fight on some issues. One of them is poverty. I don't see why we can't have a principle of that in any framework passed for local authorities to decide on further detail. We have to consider the impact on shift workers, part-time workers. How will the scheme take that into account? Um, I've consulted in numerous workplaces who are concerned about this. Um, on the issue that John Mason raises about regional transport authorities, um, I, I think they're not accountable enough to have such a power, and I would consider that that is not, um, uh, that is not where we should end up. On this one. It, it will be decades in Glasgow before we see the requisite investment with Nottingham having nine million a year raised on this. It is not enough. Uh, you can see that it's going to be a decade before public transport would be good enough even in Scotland's largest city before but people would make the choice uh, not to drive. Uh, on the question of the referendum, I would ask John Finney to see then, uh, it, he asked Colin Smith uh, why he has so little faith in local authorities, I would ask well, why he has so little faith in the people to make a decision in their own localities as to whether they want a parking levy or not. Um, I support Jamie Green's amendment. I'd like to uh, uh, just acknowledge it, that uh, the welfare and people's standards of living is a matter for this parliament. If we pass this into law, it's our job to consider the welfare uh, of people in passing legislation. Uh, we've heard not very much about how this would be enforced. Perhaps we'll hear that further down the line. But I want to hear about how this will impact um, on people's lives who already face poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, I would normally now call Dean Lockhart to speak to Amendment 80, but he's uh, involved in other business in the Parliament, and Jamie Green's going to speak to that amendment. Thanks, Amir. I, I'll only speak to Dean Lockhart's amendments. I think that's a protocol, and I'll come back and speak to other amendments in this group, including my own, when it's my turn to do so. Um, Dean sends his apologies. There was perhaps a lack of uh, understanding as to when we may be addressing this issue, and uh, MSPs appreciate have other uh, committee and MSP duties to attend to. So uh, he's asked me to, to uh, reflect upon uh, these amendments with the committee. Amendment E. Uh, is uh, similar in some senses to Mike Rumble's Amendment A. I think uh, Mr Rumble's uh, uh, had the right intention of uh, uh, leaving out business customers from the levy. It just strikes me as, as strange that uh, uh, we would want people uh, who are customers of businesses to be part of the levy of the business that they're visiting. It doesn't really stipulate 
uh, what the purpose of those, vis those visits may be or the length of time they may spend or, or indeed uh, we would like to take this further to include the uh, suppliers of businesses. Uh, so, for example, many small businesses uh, get parts delivered. I have a few in my constituency, I'm sure Mr Lockhart does too, uh, where uh, other small and medium-sized businesses turn up to deliver goods or do contract or work for a short period of time to assist that business in its efforts. It would seem unfair for those to, to be penalised in the same light. I believe that's the premise behind 8 E. Yes, happily. Uh, leading that as an amendment, you know, that people turn up for maybe half an hour or even come to repair a, an air conditioning unit and they're going to be expected to pay a car parking levy. You surely are not pressing, uh, uh, suggesting that. No, I hope not. You're absolutely right. Um, it, would, it would seem uh, very unfair to do so and, and place such a That's charge. Uh, but but, but nice. with, with respect, um, we, we read the amendments to the, to, the, to the bill that Mr Finney submitted and a number of us uh, felt that it wasn't uh, secure enough in ensuring that business customers uh, would be exempt from the charge. Now, if, if uh, the Minister, or indeed Mr Finney, in his summing up, can point us to the specific wording of his amendment that gives us that comfort and security, then we can take a view as to where they move those amendments. But in the absence of that, we read the amendments and we took a view that it doesn't cover that. And indeed, I don't want to end up in the scenario, uh, in Mr Lai, where in your constituency, customers turn up to small businesses and are part of the scheme of that business. So we want to put it on the face of the bill that they're absolutely excluded. Why wouldn't they? And I hope other members would agree with me on that. Uh, it's not nonsense, Mr Stevenson. If you're welcome to intervene, if you have comments to make. In, my in, in fairness, um, uh, Jamie, I'd ask you to push on and, and ignore any comments on that. Just say to, Thank you, to, 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 to all committee members, this is obviously an interesting subject which has caught the public eye and, and, and actually making comments uh, under one's breath about other people's uh, views on it is not helpful. So I'd ask just people to refrain from doing that. And, and try and look at the legislation. So I'd ask you, Jamie, to continue on Amendment 8E, which you've agreed to speak to. Thank you. I've got nothing further to say on Amendment 8E. On Amendment 8F, in the name of Dean Lockhart, uh, this seeks to narrow down the definition uh, of what constitutes a relevant person in the legislation uh, and stipulates that it only applies to the person that provides the uh, parking place in, uh, in question. Uh, and the, this amendment is the uh, route to achieve that. Uh, amendment 8G uh, removes uh, a number of, uh, I'm just checking the wording of it, yes, uh, removes education and government institutions from the definition of businesses and also in relation to Amendment 8E deletes the section defi defining business customers and clients or customers of the relevant person. I know we talk in greater detail in the exemption section so I'll leave comments around removals of places uh, to that debate. Uh, and Amendment 8H uh, is the amendment in Mr Lockhart's name that seeks to ensure that only employees working full-time and on permanent contracts are subject to the conditions of the levy. Uh, and this would uh, ensure that part-time members or short-term contractual staff such as those uh, doing day temping jobs, uh, which is quite common practice in many, many businesses, uh, would not be subject uh, to the levy, and it would indeed only relate to permanent uh, full-time members of staff. It Is seems. Uh, yes. How, how would it affect a job share? Mm. A job share in what respect, Mr. Mayor? That two people did 18 and a half hours each instead of doing one person doing 37. Indeed. Well, I would argue if you're earning uh, a salary of 18 and a half hours a week, it would seem unfair to uh, be forced to pay the same levy as someone earning 36 hours a week. So I think the exemption should apply. Therefore, uh, nothing further to add on those amendments. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, and now, uh, call on John Mason to speak to Amendment 9A and the other amendments in the group. John. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. And first of all, can I say how much I support uh, the workplace parking levy and uh, the uh, amendments 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14 uh, in the name of John Finney? I think it's worth uh, stressing that uh, this, these amendments do only empower local authorities. It's about decentralising, it's about giving power to local authorities, and they may or may not uh, take them up, and some have already said they will take them up, and some have not. But I think the committee was very impressed by Nottingham's example of what they have done and the success of that. We understand that a number of other English authorities uh, are looking at following that model. 
Frankly, convener, we have to discourage people unnecessarily taking their cars to work. And that's especially the case in city centres like Glasgow and Edinburgh, and certainly the case for MSPs uh, in this parliament. Uh, I mean, Glasgow specifically has very low car ownership. Uh, so on the whole, this is not affecting uh, poorer people. This is affecting richer people. This is a tax on the elite. Um, and uh, I would say this is broadly a progressive measure and um, it's something to be very much supported. I especially like the park and ride system that they have in Nottingham, and I think we do need to do more of that uh, in and around Glasgow. Uh, absolutely. I just wondered if the member thinks that this is an issue for the elite who have cars and that poor people don't have cars. Um, just in case you might be wrong about that, would you therefore support exemptions then for those who earn under, say, the living wage, for example? Well, the, the whole point of this is this is a levy on the employer. The employer does not need to pass this on at all. And so um, the that you're to, then? Well, for example, in this place, the cleaners and the technical staff do not have parking places in the Scottish Parliament. It's the MSPs that have parking places. But you're contradicting yourself because you said it's not necessarily going to get passed on to the workers. But so who are the elite then? If the, if the, if the levy is only to be on the employer, then you're suggesting that it's never going to be passed on. But then on the other hand, you say, well, cleaners won't pay it. So which is it? Well, I think the point is that, um, that at present, the people who generally in the city centres who are getting parking places are the directors, the bosses, these kind of people. It is not, the, in, I, I think out of town is different, but I think in the city centres on the whole, it is not the ordinary workers who are getting free parking places. Did Mr Green want to come in as well? Very, very happy to. I mean, the, the idea, people watching this, uh, thinking that it's only the elite, it's only directors and rich businessmen that get parking spaces at their place of work, yeah. must be watching in absolute horror at what's being said by this committee. Mr Mason, it's, it's absolutely not true that it's only the elite who park at their place of work. Every day, normal workers park at their place of work. Can't you see that? Not in the city centre. Are you, are you, is the member seriously arguing that ordinary workers get free parking places commonly in the city centres? Look at the yes. Can I ask you to take an, uh, uh, an intervention, yes. intervention yes. on that? Sorry, that was my response. Um, yeah. uh, as a member of this parliament who often works later into the evening, um, I, I don't believe it's just MSPs who get car, car, car parking spaces. In fact, often when I turn up on a, on a Sunday evening or a Monday evening or an evening during the week, it is actually security staff and people working in the parliament who are coming up coming in to help and get the parliament ready for the next day. They are using those parking spaces, perhaps not during the day, but at night as much as any MSP. And I wondered if you'd accept that point. I would accept that they get parking spaces if the MSPs don't require them. So the, the, the norm is that the parking spaces are for the MSPs, for company directors, for these kind of people. And I would suggest that if people are travelling within Glasgow and within Edinburgh, there is an extremely good public transport system and people should not normally need to take their cars for a nine to five job and just leave the car sitting all day. However, I, I am not ruling out the fact that, of course, there are people from outside the city, uh, and including the convener, uh, who come from a distance, public transport doesn't work, and of course, some people need to use their cars. But the overall point of these, this levy is to reduce the a level of traffic in the city centres which is not sustainable, cannot keep growing, and, and we need to tackle it. If I can move on to my own amendment, uh, which is 9A, that was uh, really just to flag up the question as to how both the Cabinet Secretary and the member moving uh, these amendments thinks that uh, RTPs might be involved, because they are major players in the transport field. Uh, I do actually take uh, John Finney's point that there could be confusion, there could be duplication, uh, so I'm not going to push this, uh, and there would have been a lot of successive uh, consequential amendments if I had been pushing it. Um, but uh, I, I do think it, it partly would answer the question of how can we be more joined up? And I mean, for example, one extremely good example of park and ride is at Croy, between Glasgow and Edinburgh, 
and uh, that is in, I think, North Lanarkshire, but it's Glasgow and Edinburgh that would be raising the levy. And I think we do need to see these councils working together. I accept that the, uh, the proposal is that they can work together, uh, but I just wondered if, if what the thoughts of both the, the member moving and the Cabinet Secretary was, which maybe he can comment later on, uh, as to how maybe that could be strengthened and maybe RTPs be brought into the equation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, John, I now call on Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 9B and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Amendment 9B in my name requires uh, parking levy schemes to be signed off by ministers. This is the case with LEZs and other similar schemes and would provide an additional element of oversight. I note this amendment is supported even by those who support a workplace parking levy, such as Friends of the Earth. Uh, John Finney says this goes against his view that all decisions should be made by local councils, yet the reality is his amendment provides national exemptions, so it does seem that localism is only actually selected localism. Uh, amendments 10A and 10B in my name would require a ballot to be held to agree the introduction of a scheme. This will democratise the process and ensure it has public support. A similar ballot was held on the possibility of a congestion charge in Edinburgh, so there is precedent. Much has been said about consultation, uh, but if consultation is so important, then why not have the ultimate consultation and let people decide in a ballot? To use John Finney's uh, phrase that he used earlier, uh, why does those who oppose this have such little faith in the public? Thank you, Colin. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 9D and other members, uh, other amendments in the group? Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Uh, so I'll, I'll now speak to my own uh, amendments in this group. It's quite a, a large group, so I'll keep my comments to my amendments. But I should add that I will be supporting the amendments in the name of Mike Rumbles, uh, of uh, Pauline McNeil, uh, and indeed uh, Colin uh, Smith. For the majority. Um, on my own amendments, uh, Amendment 9D uh, seeks to uh, insert a number of conditions uh, that the local authority must uh, take uh, before uh, setting up a scheme. Uh, if you look at uh, what is uh, in C, D, E and F, which I've added uh, to uh, Amendment 9, I think it's right that the local authority should demonstrate the need for a scheme. That it, should not, that it should be able to demonstrate that displacement of vehicles as a result of the scheme does not increase pollution uh, in the areas to which the vehicles are displaced, uh, that the, any such workplace parking level will not have a detrimental impact on employment levels uh, in the local authority area, or indeed the economic impact of a negative effect, and indeed that a workplace parking levy cannot be introduced uh, in an area where there is also a low emission zone. And the reason for that uh, simply is that when we took evidence of what is the point of a levy, well, if the point is to deter people from driving into cities, there are other means to do so. Other cities have successfully introduced congestion charges uh, to uh, uh, try and encourage behaviour of not driving into cities where it's not possible. But if you have to, uh, then there is a fee associated with that, uh, such as the case in London. There is also uh, uh, low emission zones, which will tackle uh, the sorts of vehicles that we don't want in our cities. And uh, broadly speaking, there is cross-party support for those measures. But we've always been clear since this was introduced that uh, the Scottish Conservatives are in principle opposed to the workforce parking levy. Uh, we see it as a regressive tax on motorists, on workers, and far from what Mr Mason said, uh, uh, it's not just uh, rich directors and business owners who park at their place of work. If we pass this legislation and the amendments that Mr Finney suggests, then this could theoretically, uh, if established in their local authority area, uh, impact on any worker in Scotland, uh, other than those that we exempt as we go through this process. Um, on my other amendments, Amendment D stipulates that local authorities should pub publish an impact assessment. I appreciate Mr Finney's uh, uh, um, intentions on preparing and publishing the scheme and the objectives of the scheme, an assessment of the impacts of the proposal already in 10. Those are very welcome uh, comments. However, I've taken it further, and I would like to see on the face of the bill that the local authorities must uh, set out a report detailing the impact that the levy will have on low-income households, on small and medium-sized businesses in the vicinity of the workplace levy scheme, and indeed persons with disability 
or in permanent. These are three groups that I think we as a parliament uh, should be talking about uh, when we look at introducing taxes and charges and levies. And I think it's important that that is on the face of the bill, that local authorities cannot uh, look past these uh, groups. Uh, as it's currently worded, Amendment 10 by Mr Thinney does not dictate or state uh, what groups have to be consulted uh, and the assessment uh, that the levy will have on those groups. And I think these are f uh, three uh, uh, groups of people that we as a parliament should be focusing on. Uh, on Amendment 10F, uh, this additionally adds uh, an assessment on local businesses and island communities. And I think that's important. This committee spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, our island communities. And I think it seems right and proper uh, that we look at the assessment of any levy in which a local authority area has island communities would have on those. Uh, in my own uh, region, for example, if North Ayrshire Council uh, decided as a result of the enabling legislation to introduce a levy, I would like them to introduce, uh, to perform uh, robust impact assessments on the effect that would have on the islands of Iron and Cumbria, where, for example, uh, public transport is limited uh, at certain times of the day only, and indeed many people simply have to drive to their place of work. Uh, if you look at the example of some of the distilleries uh, or indeed uh, uh, production facilities on iron, uh, driving to work simply is the only way to get there. Um, and I would like to ensure that we do not, as a parliament, pass legislation that negatively impacts our island communities, notwithstanding uh, the Islands Bill and the additional duties that authorities have as a result of that. And I hope that's something that members will consider and support uh, amendment 11A is a technical amendment in respect of how uh, a, a, a scheme may be uh, re uh, revoked. Uh, amendment uh, 12B was introduced uh, because I think that if this parliament uh, does its job uh, and we see that a levy has been introduced and is having a severe uh, negative impact uh, on any particular area of Scotland, then we as a parliament should be able to uh, ask that local authority to uh, uh, review uh, and indeed uh, have the ability to revoke a scheme where it is having such a negative uh, effect on the Scottish economy. I think that's a helpful power for this Parliament to have that currently does not exist. Am Amendment 12A is a technical one to help facilitate that. Amendment 14A uh, would remove requirement for licences in the scheme to specify the maximum number of vehicles that can be parked at any workplace. I don't see any tangible benefit in having a maximum, as is currently drafted in Amendment 14 by Mr Finney, so I'd like to remove that cap. And on the issue of petitions, uh, now I appreciate there may be some disagreement on whether 20% is a suitable trigger. I'm happy for members to amend that at the next stage. But if it is the view of local residents and local businesses that this levy is having a negative impact on their business, on their communities and in their local authority area and such is the strength of support that the local authority is simply not listening in terms of review or revocation of such a scheme, then I would like to give uh, some power to the people in that respect. And if the strength of feeling is such, and I'm happy for that threshold to be raised if members feel that 20% is too low, um, then it is only right that the, the local authority is forced to review its scheme. If local people are telling them, quite simply, stop, this is uh, causing us harm at small businesses. And I think that would be uh, a useful uh, welcome uh, power to give the people in the local authorities. Um, I'm happy to leave my comments at that because I know other members have spoke at length to their own amendments. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I've got two members who wish to speak, uh, unless anyone else does at the moment. I'm going to call Richard Lyle to start with. Thank you, convener. Over the last number of months, um, I've previously made comments about the workplace parking levy. Uh, over the, those, since the, those comments, I've listened to the evidence been uh, put about by uh, various uh, organisations and also, in particular, COSLA. And I've also uh, listened to the point about the climate emergency and um, people who are in fact, demonstrating outside this parliament today. I was previously SNP group leader in COSLA in 2007-09 and previously a councillor for over three decades. So I believe in localism. I believe in councils being able to take um, uh, the decisions on behalf of the, of the thing and the democratic process. 
But I also learned as a politician, uh, and I'm coming up for my 43rd year uh, in politics, um, where people have made, uh, as I used to do, I used to scaremonger, the same as other parties are now doing in this parliament in regards to this policy. And I think some of the amendments that have been put in and some of the comments that have been made are totally uh, not correct. So therefore today I will be changing my view and I will be supporting uh, Mr Finney in his because I believe that councils should have the ability to raise if they, if they believe. Some councils will use it, uh, some councils won't use it. And I think it will be uh, a thing. So I, um, I know that at the end of the day, I will have people who will come back at me because of the comments that I previously made. So be it. I have been a politician long enough. But at the end of the day, I have uh, made up my mind that I will be supporting Mr Finney's am uh, amendment. Thank you, Kinnear. Thank you. Does any other member of the committee wish to say something? I, I, I would then like to say something. Uh, before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. It's a difficult position as convener sitting at the, this table uh, to allow your views to be represented and to represent the views of the committee. And there comes a time when, as convener, you have to take your convener's hat off and say what you believe. And so I'm now taking my hat off as convener and speaking as a member of the committee. First of all, I've listened carefully to the evidence that had been given uh, during the evidence session, and I'm thankful as a committee that we were able to take that evidence. It became clear during the evidence session to me that there were three ways of tackling uh, the uh, emissions within towns and villages and cities. Those were su suggested as congestion charging, uh, low emission zones, and uh, workplace parking levies. It was also suggested and made very clear during those evidence sessions to me that uh, you could only choose one. You couldn't choose a multiple of them because they were therefore uh, conflicting on each other. Also listen carefully to the evidence that was given at the committee about from Nottingham. And it, it appears to me that Nottingham is completely different to the majority areas of Scotland when it comes to public transport, in the fact that they have e excellent public transport areas uh, and provision in Nottingham, which allows people not to take cars into city centres. I believe that in Scotland we are in a different area, areas with large rural hinterlands, where people do have to travel into cities and have little chance to take public transport. Indeed, sometimes I know from areas that I have worked in, that if you get on a bus to go somewhere, that you have to catch that very same bus to get back to where you've come from without interruption to be able to, you, to make the uh, right connections. I have a little doubt in my mind that looking around and the way that this will uh, be passed on and from the evidence that we've heard, that employers will pass on uh, taxation uh, to employees uh, or certainly ask them to share it. Therefore, I believe that this becomes a tax on going to work, and therefore I don't believe it's progressive. I think we've discussed, and I've made my intervention uh, during Mr Mason's speech about how people use car parks at odd times of the day when normal workers are not using them uh, so that they can service buildings and make sure that they're working for the next day. I don't think it's right for those people that work in hours uh, outside normal working hours to have to pay for a tax. I also have listened to what Mr Lyle has said about being a politician. I have not been a politician for 43 years, and I will not be a politician for 43 years. In fact, I have got into politics so that I could make and stand on difficult decisions. Therefore, I make it abundantly clear at the outset of this that I do not support the working place parking levy. I don't support any part of it, and I don't believe it will achieve anything for the, from the climate's point of view. And therefore, I will vote for amendments where I see that it will uh, benefit should this legislation be passed. But I will not vote for the legislation because I don't think it's in the interest of people who go to work in Scotland. Having made that statement, I now put my convener's hat back on. I thank the committee members for allowing me to do that and for not interrupting me when I do it. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to, to make comment. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. John Finney has set out the case for local authorities to have the powers to introduce workplace parking levies. 
As we consider the amendments, you can see that this is a carefully crafted proposal which is very much about empowering local authorities and giving tools to address issues such as climate, the climate emergency. No single action can do this, but we need all the available powers at our disposal to meet these pressing challenges. In the recent debate on the stage one uh, of the Climate Change uh, Scotland Bill, all parties were clear on the need for action, with opposition spokespersons stating that we face a national environment and climate emergency, that we need to take further action and that we should not postpone taking hard decisions. Yet, a modest and completely discretionary power for local authorities to act has attracted furious criticism from these very same parties. Turning to the amendments, other amendments in the group, these appear to me to range from being well-meaning to those that I can only assume are designed to frustrate the proposal. I firmly agree with John Finney's approach to localism in decision making, and I'm disappointed at what appears to be a lack of confidence that some members have in local authorities in using these discretionary powers. It is worth restating some of the key principles of John Finney's amendments. This is a power for local authorities, not a duty. It is underpinned by duties to consult and to carry out impact assessments on persons affected and the environment. It is strategic as it is linked to achievement of activities set out in a local transport strategy. And funds raised must be spent on the scheme and transport related activities. On a very point raised by John Mason and the role of RTPs. Of course, no local transport strategy can be shaped in isolation, and the drafting and development of any local transport strategy to support such a proposal by a local authority will require due consultation with RTPs. That is a provision which will be set out in guidance to accompany the legislation. Convener, for these reasons, I support John Finney's amendments and I cannot support the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on John Finney to wind up on Amendment 7, please, Mr yeah. Finney. Thank you, Convener. There's been much discussion. I'll just leave the comments as they are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finney. Mike Rumbles, can I ask you to wind up on Amendment 7 and A and ask you to press and withdraw it, please? Well, I think we're making bad law, and I think the deal between the SNP and the Greens budget deal has shackled the committee in our work. It's quite obvious... The SNP members and Green members are not accepting any of the constructive amendments at all designed to improve this bill, and we can't do our job. So I want to see... I want to see... I, yeah, OK. With, with Mr Rumble share my frustration and the sadness at the way that we're legislating, because this, we did nothing on this at stage one. Uh, this should have been introduced at, by the government at stage one, so that we as a committee would have a proper chance to scrutinise it, to consult with the public, with the businesses and with the people that are going to be affected by the law that this committee is passing. And I'm deeply saddened by the process that we've gone through to squeeze it in at stage two. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I, I, I'm deeply saddened. Uh, I, when I joined this parliament 20 years ago, I thought the great thing about it was its committee work. But um, the SNP members are being whipped to support the Green Amendment. They're not accepting any amendments. Oh, it's quite obvious they are. No, no, come on, let's stop playing games. This is too important to play games. And we've, we've, put down, we've put down constructive amendments to try and improve the amendment. And I really plead with the um, Transport Secretary because we've tried to be constructive throughout this whole process, and this is not being constructive. We're trying to make good law. We might not like the amendment, but we could certainly improve it. And I, I therefore, um, I want the presiding officer, I want to be able to, the presiding officer to put these amendments again, and I hope we'll have some time to think about these uh, at stage three. So I'm not going to move 7A uh, because I want the presiding officer to accept my amendments for debate at stage three, where hopefully we can get some constructive changes to the amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. As Mr. Rumbles wishes to withdraw Amendment 7A, I have to ask, does any member wish to object? No member wishes to object, therefore the Amendment 7A is withdrawn. I therefore call Amendment 7D in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 7. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Uh, I will move, but just before I do that, uh, uh, I would just like that I would, I would just like... Right. You, you can move it or not move it. There isn't a chance to uh, debate it. We, we've had the chance to debate, so it is just purely an opportunity to move or not move. Well, so I'm... I ask you to, whether you want to move it or not move. I will move it. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. 7D. Sorry. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 7D is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 7B in the name of Paulie McNeill, already debated with Amendment 7. Paulie McNeill, to move or not move? Move. Uh, the, the question, therefore, is Amendment 7B agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 7B is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 7C in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 7. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Certainly moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 7B, C be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Right up, please, gentlemen. And ladies, those against, please raise their hands. Those abstentions, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are six votes against, and there's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 7C is not agreed. Uh, therefore, I call on John Finney to press or withdraw Amendment 7 as amended. Yeah, press. Or not amended, sorry. Not press amended. Committed. Sorry, place. place convener. The question, therefore, is Amendment 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on, those against, please raise their hands. <laughs> sorry. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 7 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 8 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. I therefore call Amendment 8E in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 7. Uh, Jamie Green to move or not move on his behalf? Not move. Okay. Uh, right, hold on. 18. I therefore call Amendment 8A in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 8F in the name of Dean Lockhart, already amend, uh, debated with Amendment 7. Uh, Jamie Green to move or not move on his behalf? Not move. OK, I therefore call Amendment 8B in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. OK. I therefore call Amendment 8G in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 7. Uh, Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 8C in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 8H 8, 8 in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 7. Uh, Jamie Green to move on or not move on his behalf? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 8D in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. John Finney to press or withdraw Amendment 8, please. Please can be done. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for and five votes against.
against. Therefore, Amendment 8 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 9 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move. Move, Commissioner. Will not move. Oh, it's moved. Call Amendment 9A in the name of John Mason, already debated with Amendment 7. John Mason to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 9C in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Well, I thought this was the most constructive amendment, but I'm not moving it, hopefully, until Stage 3. OK, I therefore call Amendment 9B in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? I'll move it, convener. OK, the question is that Amendment 8, 9B be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. OK, there are four votes. Four, seven votes against, therefore Amendment 9B is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 9D in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. OK. The question, therefore, is John Finney to press or withdraw Amendment 9, please. The question is, <coughs> Amendment 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. Sorry, the amendment is agreed. Sorry. Well, I'm afraid it's a democracy, Mr Rumble, so we go with the democracy. Uh, therefore, I call Amendment 10 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John, Mini John Finney to move or not move, please. Move, convener. I therefore call Amendment 10D in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 10A in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? Let him move, convener. OK. The question is, uh, Amendment 10A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 10A is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 10B in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 10E in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 10C in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 10F in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 10, 10G in the name of Peter Chapman already debated with Amendment 7. Peter Chapman to move or not move? Not move. The, the John Finney, therefore, I ask you whether you wish to press or withdraw Amendment 10, please. Press, convener. The question is that Amendment 10, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 10 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 11 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. <coughs> John Finney to move or not move? It move, convener. I call Amendment 11A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 11. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore ask John Finney whether you wish to press or withdraw Amendment <coughs> 11, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, press, can we know? The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for. There are five votes against. Therefore, Amendment 11 is agreed. I call Amendment 12 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. I call <coughs> Amendment 12A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, convener, happy to not move 12A and 12B. Thank you. Uh, I therefore ask... Uh, John Finney, to press or withdraw Amendment 12, please. Press, convener. The question is, Amendment 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 12 is agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, Convener. I therefore call Amendment 13A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I therefore ask John Finney whether you wish to press or withdraw Amendment 13. Press, Convener. The question, therefore, that Amendment 13 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 13 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 14 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, Convener. I call Amendment 14A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. The question, therefore, John Finney, is do you wish to press or withdraw Amendment 14? Press, Convener. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Sorry. There are six votes for, there are five votes against, therefore Amendment 14 is agreed. We are now going to move on to working place parking exemptions, and I can shortly take a break, but I'm going to call Amendment 15 in the name of John Finney Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out that if Amendment 15A is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 15B due to a preemption. <coughs> Furthermore, if Amendment 16M is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 16AH again due to a preemption. John Finney, can I ask you please to Amendment 15 and speak to all the amendments in the group? Mr Finney. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, convener, uh, much of the discussion around workplace parking labels has been around exemptions. What will be exempt? Why would groups be exempt? And who will apply the exemptions? <coughs> Excuse me. Amendment 15 sets out the basis for exemption under the scheme. It covers four key areas. It requires that any workplace parking licensing scheme must include any national exemptions set by Scottish ministers, as well as the national exemptions provided for in the Bill. The proposed national exemptions in the Bill are set out in amend my Amendment 16. Amendment 15 also gives local authorities powers to set further exemptions. This is a wide-ranging power as these exemptions can apply to specific premises, specific number of parking places, persons or motor vehicles. This is really important as it allows local authorities to draw up a scheme in the light of local circumstances and they have a wide scope as to what exemptions they can apply and how they apply them. This approach builds on the flexibility um, in the scheme in how a scheme may be ap applied in my Amendment 7. I firmly believe that the local level is the place to determine for that exemption, it's not the national stage. It's self-evident that informed decisions make at lo local level will be better meeting the needs of an area. These decisions will be based on an understanding of local issues and preferred outcomes. My amendments ensure that the scheme can be tailored to meet local needs and circumstances. This is far, is far removed from the rigid one-size-fits-all picture that opponents of the workplace parking levies have painted. Amendment 15 also ensures that only one scheme can cover the same premises at any given time, and it gives Scottish ministers the power, through regulations, to provide for other exemptions or to restrict exemptions. My Amendment 27 requires that these regulations be by affirmative procedure. This means that any proposals for national exemption in the future will face full and transparent scrutiny. I firmly believe that the framework for exemptions delivers the clarity that is sought while giving the flexibility to implement local schemes to meet local needs. Amendments 15A and 15B are on exemptions for, fault for small car parks. Um, Amendment 15A from Colin Smith seeks to make a business with 15 parking places or fewer or any higher number that the local authority did to examines exempt from charges under any work, workplace parking levy scheme. Amendment 15B from Jamie Green seeks to set this at 20 parking places. This covers the same ground as Mike Rumble's Amendment 7A that we considered earlier. <coughs> So Colin Smith wants a minimum threshold to be 15 parking places, Jamie Green wants 20, and Mike wanted 10. 
Mike Grumbles. This variation makes my point that it is best left to the local authority to decide. Why would we apply random thresholds at a national level to a local scheme? Let's leave it to the people who have to design, plan and implement and assess the impact of a scheme and consult in that scheme to decide. Ultimately, they will have to justify their decisions to the electorate. And the framework that my amendments provided provide deliver this clarity and flexibility. I cannot support Amendment 15A or 15B. Amendment 16 sets out the national exemptions that should be applied to workplace parking licensing scheme. These are parking places for blue badge holders and equivalent disabled parking badges, qualifying NHS premises and places at hospices. I would like to address each of these in turn. I'm sure that the committee will welcome the exemption for blue badge spaces as well as protecting the rights of disabled people, it also provides an incentive for those with premises liable for the levy to consider making more of such parking spaces, places available. Committee members will be well aware that the exclusion of hospitals and NHS premises from the workplace parking levy was part of the budget agreement. This amendment delivers that. But the inclusion of the NHS in my amendment is about more than their budget agreement. It's difficult to imagine a more strategically important and distinctive function than that which is provided by the NHS on a national level. And this is something that resonates with the public. I'm aware that there are other sectors which also have national uh, significance, of course. But it's important to be clear, not having a national exemption does not mean that a workplace parking licensing scheme will apply in a local situation. There are a number of steps that will shape this. My apologies if this seems to be self-evident, but much of the criticism of my amendments, and indeed many of the amendments lodged to Amendment 16, seem to miss this point. Step one is that a local authority will have to decide if they wish to set up a scheme. It is really up to them if they wish to. Step two is that the local authority will set out the scope of the scheme. As part of that, they will determine local exemptions. This will then be subject to detailed assessment of the impact on people affected and the environment. Step three will be consultation. And finally, if a scheme is implemented, it will be levied on premises, not people. If a scheme is implemented, it will be levied on premises, not people. It will be a matter for the occupiers of these premises, whether they pass on the levy if it's applied at all. Underpinning my approach to workplace parking levies is the principle of localism. The national strategic importance of the NHS warrants a national exemption, but otherwise I believe that the decisions on how a workplace parking scheme will operate, including additional exemptions, are best made at local level. Decisions that will be part of a wider strategic vision of the needs of an area, underpinned by a detailed impact assessment, indeed assessments. So my view is clearly that national exemptions should very much be the exception to the rule. I accept there's a lot of interest in exemptions, but the vast bulk of the amendments in this group appear to be a shopping list of additional national exemptions. Some of these are for, for sectoral groups, while others name individual companies. I've no doubt that these amendments are sincerely proposed, but taken as a whole, it appears that they are trying to weaken the provisions so that a workplace parking levy never gets off the ground. And that goes against the principles of localism, underpinned by a strategic approach that my amendment delivers. I'd like to say a little more, uh, convener, about the definition of NHS. For the purposes of the amendment, the NHS is widely defined widely. It will include GPs, for example. This rep represents the continuum of care that the public expect the NHS to deliver. My amendment also includes a national exemption for hospices. Some hospice, hospices are on NHS premises, while some are not. To adore a distinction between different hospices on where they are located seems to be inappropriate, and I have therefore attempted to make clear that all hospices, hospices should be exempt regardless of location. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to 16 subsection 2, subsection B of my amendment. This is allows for NHS premises that do not deliver NHS services to be liable for the levy. This would cover circumstances where NHS premises were, for example, let to a company that does not directly provide NHS services. I believe that this is right and that the public will view this as right. Amendments, um, all the amendments attempt to add to the national exemption, the range from sector group, different sort of premises and private companies. Um, 
they go against the principles of localism that underpin the scheme. And I've asked, why is there so little trust in local authorities to make decisions at local level? I believe the framework I have set out provides the clarity and flexibility required to deliver on the ground. We know COSLA want this. In summary, I would ask the committee to support amendments 15, 16 and 27 and I name. I would ask other members not to move their amendments in this group, but I would ask the, vote, the committee to vote against them if they are. And I move amendment 15. Convenient. Thank you very much, uh, John. Now, there are uh, there's eight uh, members who, who wish to, to uh, speak to the, or will be given the opportunity to speak to them, their amendments. And then there will be uh, opportunity for the committee to speak. And then I'm going to call the Cabinet Secretary. And just for the committee's thing, I am then going to be unconventional and cause, uh, call a, a suspension at that stage before we go into a lengthy period of voting uh, to allow people uh, a, a five-minute break. So I'm going to push on now with Colin Smith uh, to move Amendment 15A and speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. My uh, amendment um, adds in a number of additional um, exemptions um, to the proposed workplace uh, parking levy. I have to say, John Finney once again contradicts himself uh, on the one hand saying that local government should decide um, what the exemption should be, but at the same time moving a number of uh, national exemptions. It seems that um, local democracy is when uh, the Greens and SNP decide that local democracy should exist. Amendment 15A in my name calls for car parks with 15 spaces or less to be exempt. Um, Amendment 15B by Jamie Green makes a similar suggestion, but sets and a minimum at 20 spaces. I think either would be a welcome addition, and I'm happy to support either of those amendments. It sets a very clear um, figure for businesses uh, that cover several areas in Scotland to know exactly what their rules are that they will have to play by. Amendment 16C, uh, in my name, would exempt uh, police premises. We've heard that NHS premises rightly should be exempt because that's a national service. Well, it seems to me that maybe the Greens have failed to notice that the police service is now a national service. And police officers and staff have a unique safety need to use private vehicles to get to work and back, and so it should be exempt from any scheme. Um, likewise, Amendment 16D in my name exempts educational premises, and Amendment uh, 16AI exempts social worker. The committee received evidence that both of these groups are for a range of reasons, uh, require the use of a car to get to and from their um, place of work. Uh, Amendment 16 AGI looks to exempt shift workers and those working irregular hours who are less likely con to contribute to congestion, but more likely to struggle to find public transport out with the normal daytime uh, working day. I have to say, for the SNP to describe social workers, the police, teachers, shift workers as somehow the elite is frankly an utter disgrace. There's a significant number of proposed exemptions uh, in this section, some of which overlap with mine. I think all these proposed exemptions make a valid contribution. I'm happy to support them all. But I think the sheer volume of legitimate exemptions suggests just how utterly flawed this whole process is. The workplace parking levy is a measure that should have been if those who supported it wanted it to be a bill in itself. But so far, what we've seen is a proposal that's been slipped through at the last minute as part of a murky budget deal uh, as an amendment. That means there is no proper scrutiny by this parliament on the proposals th themselves. And that's why I utterly oppose this particular scheme and believe that exemptions should be put in place where we've clearly heard evidence in support of those exemptions. Thank you, Colin. I now call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 15B. Jamie. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm just going to. I'm not going to add too much to what Colin Smith said because I. Uh, it's not often the Labour Party and the Conservatives agree on issues of exemptions of tax or indeed issues of tax. Um, but on this, I'm sorry, that's rather uncalled for, Mr. La. You're welcome to intervene on me if you've got a comment to make. Oh, thank you for that apology. Um, this is this is important. Look, I think Mr. Rumble summed it up nicely. We're creating the law here. Um, and this, this committee has a duty, um, and I'm deeply saddened by the events of today because I don't think we're making good law. And I think the sheer volume of exemptions here, and, and let's look at the list of exemptions. And far from, and, and I appreciate actually Mr Finney made the comment that they, they were introduced with, uh, they were well intended. And, I, and I'm pleased that that's been recognised because that is the case. Now there may be other amendments that, that one could argue we're seeking to disrupt the, the mechanisms of the levy, um, and, indeed, and, that, and people are welcome to their views on that. But these are exemptions, and these are national exemptions. 
And where I disagree fundamentally with the approach that Mr Finney's amendments on this workplace parking levy takes is that it will be up to local authorities to decide local exemptions. Therefore, each city who introduces, or indeed any local authority who introduces a levy, should they do so as a result of the legislation, can decide uh, who pays and who doesn't. And that theoretically could end up in a situation where a teacher in Glasgow is liable for the charge, but not in Edinburgh, or a nurse in Aberdeen is liable, but not in Dundee. Where is the fairness in that? That is not about local democracy to me. That is about creating bad law. So this whole list that the Scottish Conservatives and indeed others, Mr Rumbles and Mr Smith have a number of other uh, ex exemptions. This should be on the face of the bill. These are the sort of hard-working people and public service workers in Scotland that this Parliament and this committee should be seeking to protect. Firefighters, policemen, train drivers, care workers, prison officers, people at park and do charity work in our high streets. Why on earth are we subjecting them to this tax? And I think we should be ashamed of ourselves. Therefore, I support all the exemptions in this group. Thank you, uh, Jamie. I now call on Miles Brigg to speak to Amendment 6N and the other amendments in the group. Thank Miles, you, Convener, and good morning to the um, committee. Um, having spoken to a number of people who work in our health and social care sector, I've brought forward a number of amendments, and I welcome the fact that John Finney has specifically also brought forward the amendment with regards to hospices. That was another amendment I was also looking to bring forward, and one which wasn't originally included. The amendments I've lodged to the bill intend to exempt people working in the health and social care from the scheme. Amendment 16O would exempt employees working for independent health care services, while 16P and 16Q cover employees of veterinary practices and people working in Scotland's air ambulance service, respectively. I've also sought to exempt adult social care providers through amendments 16R and 16S, while 16T and 16U would exempt places of residential care care establishments and health-based charities across Scotland. Finally, my amendment 16M deletes subsection 2B from section 16, which stipulates you must be a healthcare provider to qualify for exemption at the hospital. And I think that is a key point uh, if this bill goes forward, that hospitals, uh, like our parliament, require technicians, cleaners and security personnel, to name just a few, all provide a vital and key role within the hospital and NHS setting. And so it's only right that they are also exempt. Thank you very much, uh, Miles. And I call on uh, Jamie Green. Are you going to speak to Amendment 16A? Because Graham Simpson is, I believe, in a uh, Yes, I'm happy to, yeah. Uh, members will bear with me. Um, yeah, uh, 16A and B, in the, in the name of uh, Graham Simpson, who passed his apologies uh, this morning, has asked me to move these. They specifically want to uh, exempt industrial sites and heritage and construction sites in the scheme. And that's on the, the basis of uh, uh, a number of piece of consultation that he uh, and our party have been having with sites. Uh, we approached a number of uh, local authority areas and businesses within them, talked to them about the prospect of this levy. Uh, we talked to them about the effect it may have on them and their workforce. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, a comment was made that this is on the premise, not the people. But it is inevitable, as was the case uh, with the only other local authority in the entire country, uh, that's actually implemented a scheme like this, that some businesses will pass it on to their employees, and I believe will do so, not out of spite to their employees, but out of a necessity, because they simply cannot afford the levy that will be imposed on them. And I've spoken to a number of businesses uh, uh, and with regards to uh, industrial sites specifically. Let me give you some examples. And I think it's important in, in the midst of all the politics and the emotion in this that we actually listen to real local businesses. Let me take Break Scotland uh, in Newhouse. Um, as a major employer based in an out-of-town location with a 24-hour operation, we believe that the proposal for the levy would have a negative impact on our employees and people who work under such similar circumstances. The lack of public transport outside major conurbations and the ability to provide suitable, safe and regular alternatives to fit with shift patterns leave people no option to drive to work, and imposing a tax on them would, in our view, be unfair and punitive. I hope, Mr. I hope Mr Lai will reflect on that. Maybe he can comment on it. Happily take an intervention. Yeah, I think we're talking about uh, an area 
which is in my constituency. It's very, very nice to know that you, you've contacted a, a business in my constituency. Do you also know that North Lancashire Council has never, never implemented a car parking charge uh, in the number of years I was a councillor there and since? Uh, I'm pleased, but you've just voted to give them the power to do so. <laughs> but they've never I, aren't, implemented... Mr. Lott, why aren't you listening sorry, to businesses sorry, in, in your fairness, own area? In fairness, members, so, I, I'm, I'm very happy for interventions to be taken, but can we not to generate this into a conversation across the committee table. I don't think that's how the committee works, but, uh, well, it's not working like that. Jamie, if you'd like to push on, and if you'd like to make an intervention on a specific point to question uh, Jamie on something, then by, by, by all means do. Jamie, if you'd like to push thank on. Thank you. And, and I, I do thank Mr Lowe for, for, for expressing his interest in this. I would plead with him. I know we've voted on a number of these amendments already, but please have a think and listen to these businesses. Uh, what about Sutherland Brothers? At airport industrial estate at Wick Airport. Um, we operate on an industrial estate with poor public transport. Our staff have no alternative but to use their car to commute to work. Uh, this includes in the early hours of the morning or late in the evenings to get to and from work. Many of the amendments uh, uh, that we're proposing and other parties are proposing are to exempt certain shift workers, certain locations, and I think rightfully so. And I appeal to the heart of some of the members of this committee to listen to the businesses in your own patches. Listen to what they're saying. Don't listen to what we're saying. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine and decent. If you don't agree with Mr... Uh, in, in a moment. If you, don't, if you don't agree with us politically, that's also perfectly decent and fine in the committee setting. But please listen to the businesses in your own constituencies and regions. They're not happy, and we're trying to exempt them as a result of the comments that they've given us. Happy to give away. Thank the member for giving way, but would he accept that these decisions are all better made by the local authorities because they know the local area better and cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh are more keen on the levy because it's the city centres that are the big problem eh, and many other local authorities, if not all, are, are less keen on the levy eh, because they don't have city centres. But, Mr Mason, you're implying that this workplace parking levy will only be applied in cities. It doesn't say that. Nowhere in Mr Finney's suggested amendments does it state that these levies can only be applied in cities. Now, actually, uh, if that was an amendment you wanted to bring forward at stage three, I'd probably support you on that, because actually that would secure these rural uh, and, and, and suburban areas where there is poor public transport. Would the member so, get, well, in a second, but please let me respond to your first intervention. Um, you are making an assumption that it is only local authorities, city councils, who would want to introduce this levy. We are giving the power to every local authority in Scotland to do this, and the result of that will mean that businesses not in cities may have to pay the levy, and that's what we're trying to protect. Remember, those businesses, those workers. Uh, Mr Smith, happily. Remember, given that point, remember um, except that one of the, the fundamental flaws is that, although this is a power that, that some people argue will only be imposed by cities, say Glasgow or Edinburgh, the reality is thousands upon thousands of people from out with those city boundaries travel into those cities every single day for employment purposes, often from areas such as the borders, which has limited or poor public transport. But they will be forced to pay this levy, but not a single penny will be spent in their area to support improving public transport. Uh, and second, Secondly, they will have no say over this because it will be a neighbouring local authority and a city that will decide despite the fact they will have to pay. You're absolutely right, Mr Smith. And, and I think that's something we really need to reflect on, is that if Glasgow City Council introduced the levy, and I'm sure Mr Mason would support them in that, what about the workers from Ayrshire and Reclyde who have to drive to those premises in some of, let, please, please, please let me finish in some of the industrial estates with, even within cities cities have industrial estates that aren't served by public transport cities have people that work evening shifts and work early mornings and have no other means of getting to work so there's actually not just people who live within the city that you're discouraging from taking their car you're also discouraging people who have no choice to living peripheral local authorities so the actions and the consequence of those actions by a local authority who introduces a levy will be felt by neighbouring local authorities and people who live out with those local, local authorities. Mr Lowe. Give way. Oh. Yeah. Uh, sorry. The point, in the question that I posed to a councillor from Glasgow, there are quite a substantial number of people who travel into Glasgow or Edinburgh who actually pay car parking charges at the moment uh, to park uh, to go to work. 
there are some employers that do charge uh, their employers uh, for parking. Um, I think that's at the discretion of those employers. They obviously know their workforce better. Um, what I wouldn't like to do is give a, a, a blanket right that all employers have to charge uh, a, a parking charge at their place of work. And I think, and sorry, it, so, sorry. So, and, so sorry, but if, if a local... About NCP I'm, I'm talking about NCP, NCP car, park. car parks or parking in City you know, or Buchanan Galleries yep. or, or, a, or a, sorry, uh, or a, um, you know, parking meter in, in a street. So they're not getting charged by their employer. They're actually getting physically, at this moment in time, charged by the council. Indeed. So, are you, are you suggesting that they should also have to pay a workplace parking no, levy on top of the private car parking charges? So you can do that. What I'm saying is that there are people who already are paying uh, to park in Glasgow and Edinburgh. There are, and so that therefore reduces the comment that uh, Colin Smith made. The thousands of people that he suggests are going to be paying this because they, there are people who are already paying car parking charges at the moment. Uh, I just, that. Well, look, as I said, the, we're creating national legislation. Uh, we're creating the parameters of the levy which a local authority can introduce that will mandate all businesses within that local authority area to introduce a levy. There's no pick and choose here. The idea, as I said, going back to local <laughs> exemptions, that, that one local authority might decide that it's OK to exempt, but another may not, will create a huge unfairness, I think, in our working force. And as I said, uh, going back to Mr Simpson's original amendments, uh, he wants to exclude certain types of sites and locations. I think it's the right thing to do. These sites are the furthest away from our cities, the least provided by public transport, and tend to have 24 operations or shift workers. As I said, I go back to my earlier comments. Uh, I'm, I've nearly finished, but if it's important. Well, I mean, would you at least agree that we're probably all pretty well agreed that in a village or a, a, an out-of-town workplace, a, no local authority, nor us, is going to suggest that there be a workplace parking levy. So um, would you accept that we're actually at least aiming at the same thing? And the question is, do we have a more centralist approach and decide everything at the centre, or do we allow local authorities to make these decisions? Um, I, and, and I appreciate the, the, the tone and candour of which Mr Mason asked that question, and I appreciate where he's coming from. Um, but there's, again, far too many assumptions in the statement he's making. He's saying that no rural authority uh, will introduce a levy. How does he know that? You know, local authorities are by default political uh, beings, and they may choose to do so. Um, and I would say they shouldn't have that choice because of the effect that it will have will the uh, on their work. I mean, it's turning into a lengthy debate. I, I'm, I'm trying to be to polite, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, convener, but it's entirely um, up to you. Can, time. can I suggest you, I mean, it, it, it's up to you, Jamie, how many more you take. Maybe if you take one more and then try and wrap it up to allow other members to come in, um, that may be appropriate. Well, I, I, tell you what, I won't take any more intervention because I think if other members want to speak to the amendments in this group, they're welcome to put, put their hand up and, and speak to them. I think I've, I've made my point, and I would uh, ask uh, members in the committee to reflect upon, I think, the sensible list of exemptions and, and give it some genuine thought. And please do not vote against exempting some of these, uh, some of these workers. It's the right thing to do, uh, so please join us in exempting them. OK, thank you. Uh, Jamie, I'm now going to call on Mike Rumbles to speak to Amendment 16E and any other amendments in the group. Mike. Thanks, thanks convener. Um, yeah, I will start by saying um, John Finney, in his introduction, kept saying, he said it several times, that the levy is on the employer, and he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right, and I agree with him. I'm sorry, early on you did. Um, or maybe that was an aside, John. Um, it's a levy on the employer, but there's nothing to stop in, the, in this bill for the levy to be passed on to the employee. So I think i um, dancing on the head of a pin here. And I've also heard him talk uh, again about the principle of localism. I support the principle of localism, but I also support what we're supposed to do right in this parliament. Our job as members of the committee is to make good law. And I'm very exercised about this because I think that is a really important job that we do. We all come here from political backgrounds. I happen to be a Liberal Democrat, 
But my job here is to make sure that we pass law which is fit for purpose. If we, it's quite obvious to me that with all the amendments down here, um, we intend to try and improve the bill. And it's a great disappointment, as I say, that whatever amendment is being put forward, there is an instruction that this will not be allowed. This is why, I mean, when the Parliament was set up, we, 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 it was set up without a revising chamber. It was set up... I see Stuart Stevenson sh shaking his head. I was here 20 years ago, uh, Mr Stevenson, uh, at the foundation of this Parliament. I ask you not to do conversations across the table. It just well, I'm responding to what well, Mr Stuart Stevenson said. Mr Stevenson made a comment while he was sitting down without intervening. You know, I suggest you push on with the okay, point thank, that you're thank making. You, I remember when we first took our seats here 20 years ago, and there was a big debate about whether we should have had a revising chamber. And no, no, we did. it was decided that we shouldn't have one because the work of the committee was more important and the job of the committee members would be to scrutinise the legislation, particularly put forward by the government. We have a bizarre situation where, because of a political agreement, um, this amendment that John Finney is putting forward cannot be touched. I mean, this strikes at the very heart of what this parliament was designed to do. And what we're doing is wrong. Mm. And I'm saying so. No, I won't. I, I, I've listened to everybody. I haven't intervened other people. I've listened to what other people are saying. And I'm deeply disappointed by this whole shameful process in our parliamentary system. <laughs> I, I, and I would appeal to the government, um, to the Cabinet Secretary, to think hard on this and, 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 and to come back and be prepared at stage three to accept reasonable, constructive amendments that are put forward as us doing our job. Um, OK. The point about my amendments in this section are, I, I, if we are going to have national exemptions, for instance, the National Health Service, to me, it's logical that you also look around and say, what other national exemptions should you have? And trying to be constructive again, I've put some amendments in to give one example of the police service, which is a national service. And I particularly thought John Finney would, would appreciate that from his work experience and how important this would be needed. So I, I think it's a false idea that, OK, we can have a national exemption for the National Health Service. Oh, but we can't have a national exemption for anybody else. That's just not logical. Where is the logic in this? This is, this is bad law. We shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and I think I, I, I'm really frustrated and disappointed with this whole process. Thank you very much, Mike. I'm now going to call on Liam Kerr to speak to Amendment 16X and uh, other amendments in the group. Liam. Thank you, convener. I'm grateful to the committee for the opportunity this morning. Uh, I've lodged several amendments which exempt key groups from the workplace parking levy uh, for reasons well articulated by Colin Smith, MSP, earlier, and I strongly associate myself with Jamie Green's comments at the outset. Uh, in brief, amendments 16X and 16Y would see staff working at the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland exempted from the scheme. Uh, Amendment 16Z covers those working in the Criminal Justice Social Work Services, which are carried out by local authorities. Amendment 16AA covers those working for the Scottish Prison Service. Uh, my view, convener, is that these are critical services required to keep the public safe, to maintain law and order and promote rehabilitation. And it is my view that they should be exempted from this scheme and therefore I move those amendments in my name. Thank you very much, Liam. I now call on Maurice Corrie to speak to Amendment 16AB and other amendments in the group. Maurice. Uh, thank you, Gavina. Thank you, Gavina. Opportunity of coming to speak in support of these amendments. Um, yes, um, the Her Majesty's Coast Guard Service is a critical national safety service. Um, it is on a notice to move, an immediate notice. Uh, Coast Guard officers have to be in the field. Coast Guard ground officers in control have to be available and all need to be available 24 hours. And the necessity of communication and working with other emergency and blue light services. And therefore, quite often, and may, many of these are in rural areas and there is absolutely no way at two o'clock in the morning when the blue 
moon goes up that can lifeboat people or Coast Guard get to their station. They have to be there on time and, and available to go forward. So I move this amendment that they be exempt from any parking charges accordingly. Thank you, Morris. And I would normally call Alexander Stewart to speak to a member 16V, but I believe, Jamie Green, you are briefly going to speak to Sorry, I didn't cover that. Um, lifeboat service. I, I will come back to you, oh, then, right, Mr. Okay. Corrie, do, what, one more time. All right, okay, fine. No, now. Oh, now, right, I'm okay. Back to you Sorry, now. thank one you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kamina. Um, yeah, again, similarly to Coast Guard service, this is a, a, a national service. Um, it is critical to our safety of our coasts. Uh, we are a maritime nation. Uh, also, the other thing is that the, national, the Royal National Life Institution is a charity, and therefore there is no way a charity of that size or can stand any charges being absorbed by itself if it's not passing them on to the crews. So, absolutely adamant that this is uh, the crews of our lifeboats are protected, the, the lifeboat base administration and support and operational staff are protected, uh, and also it is necessary for the communications to be with them to be working with other emergency services. They have to be on call uh, and immediate uh, notice to move, uh, and therefore it's impossible to rely on public transport. Uh, they need to be available to take their cars to work. Thank you very much, Morris. And now I come to uh, call Amendment 16B. Normally, uh, this would be Alexander Stewart to move it, but I think, Jamie Green, you're going to move it on his behalf. Uh, thanks. Uh, just, for, just briefly, uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground already. I would pay attention particularly to 16W, uh, which uh, it seeks uh, to exempt uh, care workers. Um, I, I, again, I cannot for the life of me think why we would want care workers uh, as, as defined as those providing care services in the Public Services Reform Act 2010 to have to pay uh, to work unsociable hours, often at, at low pay uh, and difficult circumstances. I think it's the right thing to do. I, I, I absolutely support Alexander Stewart's amendment to exempt those workers from the levy. Uh, I hope other members will agree with me. His other amendment, I believe, is regarding uh, those who work at our Scotland's airports. As we all know, Scotland uh, relies very heavily on uh, aviation connectivity to service our islands. Uh, I don't see why an air traffic controller uh, or a security worker at Campbelltown or Barra or Kirkwall or Stornoway should have to pay a levy simply for coming and doing what I would consider a lifeline duty to service our remote and island communities. And again, I would appeal to members who have these types of uh, workplaces in their regions or constituencies to think very carefully about voting against exempting these places. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, the only member so far I've got that's indicated to wish to speak is Stuart Stevenson. So, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, Camilla. Um, this is clearly an area where there are genuine and deeply held uh, different viewpoints, and that's entirely right and proper. I think, however, members of this committee should be very careful about attributing to others how they have come to their decision based on no knowledge whatsoever in my personal case of how I have reached the decisions that I'm exercising democratically as we vote on amendments today. I did not start off from a point of view of uncritical support of this. Like others, I have engaged in quite robust debates with a range of people and come to the views that I have. And I ask that members respect my individual process and the individual process of anyone around this table holding contrary views to me or views as me and us as individuals. And I think it's entirely improper, convener, for the process by which us as individuals have come to our viewpoints to be traduced in the way that I have heard. Now, turning to more substantial matters, uh, convener, um, I think the important thing is to say, are local authorities going to behave responsibly or irresponsibly in the discharge of the duties that we are looking to give them under this provision? It's not as if we can ask that question in a vacuum. Such powers have been available to local authorities south of the border for decades. So we have a model 
that we can look at to see if local authorities behave irresponsibly in this regard. Now, if members in this committee and members of this parliament wish to say that Scottish authorities are uniquely irresponsible compared to their English counterparts, well, I invite them to say that on the record. I don't happen to believe that that's the case, not because they're Scottish, but simply because local authorities are the custodians of the interests of local people, and they behave in a proper way. It's imagine, it, 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 it's beyond contemplation uh, that people in Campbelltown are likely to find themselves subject to this, while people in Cornwall in England, where their local authority has come to the conclusion they will not make such levies. Incidentally, there are no air traffic controllers at Campbellton or Barra. There are air flight information service officers, but that's perhaps... Um, it's and, oh, but it's a very substantial here for all sorts of interesting reasons. Um, but, but bottom line is that I think we should conduct this debate with proper respect for us as individuals, and that was the main point I wish to make. In coming to my views, nobody dictates to me my views. I come to them honestly. I may be wrong at the end of the day, as all of us can be, but I come to my views honestly and independently, and I would ask members to respect that, as I respect the views of everyone else around this table. Thank you very much, Stuart. I'm now going to call uh, Pauline, and then I'm going to call Richard Lowe. Pauline. Thank you very much, Convener. I just wanted to briefly just um, address some points in relation to the exchange between uh, Jamie Green and Richard Lyle. Uh, because the people of Glasgow, if this is passed into law, are likely to face a levy um, in their workplace because that has already been declared by the authorities. Um, like Mike Rumbles and uh, Stuart Stevenson, I'm in favour of localism too, but I do believe that it's the job of this parliament to set the national policy, and we are responsible for the national policy on anti-poverty measures, and therefore, in doing our jobs, therefore, I would have thought that there should be some serious consideration given to exemptions. I've done some consultation. So Tenants, for example, is in Duke Street, which is probably regarded as being pretty close to the city centre. Uh, the workers there are concerned. They're shift workers, part-time workers. And actually, there are people who use the bus to go on the back shift because they can, but in other shifts, they can't because um, it's just not possible to get public transport certain times at night. Um, McVitie's is in, in, in Glasgow is... Uh, same company which has part-time workers, shift workers, and these are companies which are already concerned about the implications of Brexit. So even if the levy is charged on them, I think um, we would be asking committee members to consider the implications all round, not just on the workforce, but on what is already a very concerned uh, industry sector on the implications of Brexit. Uh, Edrington, which is a well-known company, a whisky company, uh, a fabulous company in Drumchapel. Um, it recruits from all over uh, Glasgow and beyond. Again, they are concerned for their part-time workers. And just lastly, convener, um, it's been expressed to me by uh, shop stewards in those um, places that they are very concerned about the impact on women workers because in some cases there's a predominantly female <coughs> workforce, many who are single parents and many who have got childcare responsibilities who need their cars and they're concerned. They're low paid workers in most of these cases and I think the shop stewards are concerned that even if the workplace levy is not passed on to them, they do fear that in the subsequent pay rounds they will effectively pay the price for that if the company has to fork out £400 or whatever the detail is of, of the charge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, Richard Lamb. Yeah, and, uh, thank you, Convener. I have to agree with the point of Stuart Stevenson. As I said earlier, I, was, uh, I made comments on the car parking levy well before it came in front of this committee, well before, months before. Um, but I'm, I'm struck by the fact that just because I have listened to the arguments, listened to the evidence, and changed my view, that I'm now being attacked. But the situation is, if I had not, and I had been voting with the other members, who the other five who feel that they're not going to listen to, 
uh, I may have been also then attacked by the other five members. So, sorry. Uh, sometimes as a politician, you've got to come off the fence. I've come off the fence in regards to, in regards to this. And, and, you know, I have to say, pure, some of these amendments are pure scaremongering. Scaremongering. Comments made by Mr Stevenson are correct. I worked in Glasgow. I paid to park in Glasgow for a number of years when I worked for the Royal Bank. I paid on the street or alternatively in a car park. I didn't have an individual car parking space, and many companies won't have individual car parking spaces for their workers. Their workers will be paying on street parking or uh, in, in car parks. Care workers, care workers are out and about visiting their, uh, the people they look after. I don't see where they park. They didn't park when I was a councillor. They didn't park in the council car park, so they wouldn't get charged for part time. Pure scaremongering. So, with the greatest respect to Mr. Rumbles and others, just because I've changed my mind, you should also change your mind. Can I can I can I just make an observation? And 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 I, I think it's interesting is is that that we have two suggestions that people are making up their mind because they're being told what to do and being criticised for making that comment. It's then wrong, in my opinion, for committee members then to criticise other people for the position they're taking. We, we all are entitled to have our opinion and, and, and therefore I think we should respect it. Before I come to the Cabinet Secretary, I again would like to take off my convener's hat and just make an observation. Is that I, I think that councils are under increased financial pressure and one of the things that happens when councils are under, ex uh, uh, under financial pressure is to look at all ways of raising revenue across their, their portfolios. Certainly saw it in Highland when looking at car parking uh, fees were being raised on, on car parks in Highland areas. So they do look at opportunities and I think my fear is that when it comes to uh, people who could be swept up in this, although councils may say at the moment they don't want to um, <clears throat> raise a working place parking levy, they may be forced into doing it as the financial position comes tougher. One other comment that I would make is there has been no investigation on the financial case for this because there are some firms that I know of who have contacted me who pay for their employees to park in public car parking spaces because they don't have the ability uh, to provide them uh, parking spaces. And it may be that should this uh, levy come in that those uh, employees will then fall into paying for their parking charges because the companies believe that everyone else pays for it. So it's an issue that's been raised for me. Cabinet Secretary, can I just call you in now? And can I just say to you that as soon as you finish speaking, we are going to pause. So, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, till the pause is yours, as it were. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, the amendments in the Mr Finney's name strike a balance between the national and local dimension. We have a national framework that allows national exemptions to be applied, but as John Finney said in moving his amendments, uh, national exemptions should be the exception, and I agree. I believe our role is to set a framework and to then let those who take forward a scheme to implement it on the ground. That is why I cannot support Amendments 15A and 15B, which seek to exempt from charges under licensing schemes any premises with 15 or fewer or fewer than 20 uh, workplace parking spaces. These numbers are arbitrary with no reference to the circumstances that a local authority will be trying to address. I think Amendment 15 has the balance right and would allow local authority schemes to exempt premises with below a maximum number of parking spaces as the scheme in Nottingham does. And so I'm happy to support the amendment. If the amendment is pressed uh, uh, to the vote, I would encourage the committee to, do, to support it. I would uh, invite Colin Smith and Jamie Green not to move amendments 15A and 15B, but if they are moved, I would ask the committee to reject them. Amendment 16 has attracted a lot of attention, at least when measured against the number of amendments uh, to it. I will return to the, uh, these uh, in considering their amendments and the range that they uh, intend to address. On the exceptions set out in Amendment 16, I fully support these. Yes, the exemption to of 
uh, hospitals and NHS premises was a condition of our support or supporting the workplace parking licensing scheme and amendments. John Finney made the case for the exemptions for the NHS very clearly in his own contribution, and I'm happy to support this approach. I also see the merit in including hospices and blue badges in the limited range of national exemptions on similar grounds. I agree with John Finney that national exemptions should be the exception. Additionally, I agree with the principles of localism and believe that significant local decisions are best made locally. That will mean that we, they are informed by local circumstances, needs and opinions. Amendment 16 has, and I believe, commitment to finish this point, Amendment 16 has, and I believe, got the balance right, and I'm happy to support the amendment. If pressed uh, to the vote, I would invite the committee uh, to support it too. I'm not too sure it was trying to make an intervention. Was it Mr Green? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, two questions. One, what, why did the government come to the view that it's only the NHS that should get an exemption and not other forms of public service workers in similar circumstances? And two, does he not agree, or why does he not think that if you give the power only to local authorities to create local exemptions, then it will create a disparity uh, between local authorities in that some uh, uh, workers will have to pay it in one area, but others not in others. How, how is that a fair policy when, as I said, a, a, a teaching assistant in Dundee doesn't pay, but one in Glasgow does? Uh, where is the fairness in that, Cabinet Secretary? Well, the purpose uh, was to give local authorities the discretion to be able to tailor schemes that reflect their local circumstances. And that's why the uh, amendments which we support uh, provide that type of flexibility for them to determine what they see as being local need. Uh, keep in mind that there is a, a, a significant level of engagement that has to be undertaken by local authorities prior to establishing such a scheme uh, to make sure that they duly consult with a whole range of different stakeholders which allows them to consider issues that are raised during the course of that process. So there's a very robust duty placed upon local authorities to consider these issues, and then ultimately it's for local elected members to come to that decision. And our decision to support the issues around the NHS is driven by the fact that it's a national service alongside the very specific issues in terms of the number of parking spaces that are very often required at hospitals, not only for those who work there, but also those who are accessing the hospital itself. And on that basis, we agree that there should be a principle of NHS uh, facilities at a national level being a national exemption. The remaining amendments in this group, of which there are 37 in total, all seek to exempt a sectorial group, uh, specified premises or a company. I was struck when reading these amendments how little they reflect the evidence this committee heard in advance of stage two. Not unreasonably, we look to Nottingham's experience of actually running a scheme. Chris Carter from Nottingham told the committee that, and I quote, the beauty of the workplace parking levy is that it is flexible and allows different exemptions to meet needs. However, another strength of the levy is its simplicity. If too many exemptions are introduced, it becomes too complicated and a lot of the benefits are lost. However, we have 37 amendments each seeking to add further nationally mandated exemptions. It's almost, uh, if you don't mind me saying, Convener, you could be left by thinking that some members don't actually want the scheme to work uh, by the range of exemptions they're seeking to put in place. I understand that these are concerns about how a workplace parking licence scheme will be applied. Mr Green, if you want to take, ask for an intervention, please do, but yeah, I don't think it's fair that, that we talk over each other when people are talking. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, but for me, the place to address these is at a local level, except in very specific cases. I am concerned that the amendment seeking to bring in additional national exemptions will have the effect of undermining local decision making and make schemes unworkable and ineffective. As a result, I cannot support these amendments and I would invite members not to move them. However, if they are moved, I would invite the committee to reject them. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Now, we are about to go on, as Cabinet Secretary has alluded to, a series of votes. But before we do that, we, the amendments will need to be pressed. But I am going to suspend the meeting now for 10 minutes, uh, and then I'm going to come back and ask uh, uh, Mr Finney and Colin Smith to move their amendments. So the meeting is suspended till 11 o'clock.
I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee. The Cabinet Secretary had just summed up, and I'm now going to move to John Finney to wind up on Amendment 15. Mr Finney. Um, Thank you, Kuna. There's been a lot of discussion on it. I, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Colin Smith, can I ask you to wind up on Amendment 15A and press or withdraw it? Colin. I'll, I'll uh, press my amendment, convener. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, before we go into the votes, I'd have to remind members that if Amendment 15A is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 15B due to a preemption. So the question is that 15, Amendment 15A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore 15A is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 15B in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question therefore is Amendment 15B are agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. And those who abstain, please raise their hands. Therefore, there are four votes for, there are six votes against, there's one abstention. There, so, therefore, Amendment 15B is not agreed. Therefore, Mr Finney, can I ask you to press or withdraw Amendment 15? Press, convener. OK, the question is that Amendment 15... Uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 16 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 15. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. I therefore call Amendment 16N in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16N be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those, yep. abstentions. Those abstentions. OK, there are four votes for, there are six votes against, there is one abstention, therefore Amendment 16N is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 16A in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green, can you move it or not move it on his behalf? Moved. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 16A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 16A is not agreed. I call Amendment 16B in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 15. Uh, Jamie Green, can you move or not move on his behalf, please? Not moved. Sorry? Not moved. OK, therefore I call Amendment 16C in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 15. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. Can be. The question, therefore, that... Amendment 16C be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Therefore, there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16C is not agreed. I call Amendment 16E in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15. Mike Rumbles, to move or not move? Well, um, I want to bring this back at stage three where we might get a fairer hearing, so I will not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 16X in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 15. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 16X be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16X is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 16Y in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 15. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16Y be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. 
Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16Y is not agreed. I call Amendment 16AB in the name of Maurice Corry, already debated with Amendment 15. Maurice Corry to move or not move? Moved. And the question therefore is that Amendment 16AB be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AB is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 16AC in the name of Maurice Corry, already debated with Amendment 15. Maurice Corry to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16AC be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Therefore, there are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AC is not agreed. I call Amendment 16D in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 15. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. Therefore, the question is, is Amendment 16D be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16D is not agreed. I would like now to call Amendment 16L in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15, Mike Rumbles, to move or not move. I'm always an optimist and I'd like to fair a hearing at stage three, so I'm not going to move it now. Okay. Um, can I just say it would help me, members, if you could just move or not move the amendment, because I, I then, I'm just saying I've got another... 14 so pages before we get to the next bit. So just keep the votes flowing, it makes it easier. So that it's not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 16F in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15, Mike Rumbles, to move or not move. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 16G in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15, Mike Rumbles, to move or not move. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 16V in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 15. Uh, Jamie Green, could I ask you to move or not move, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16V be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16V is not agreed. I call Amendment 16H in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15. Mike Rumbles to move or not moved? Not moved. The question therefore is an, not a question, it's to call Amendment 16L in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 16J in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15, Mike Rumbles, to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 16K in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15, uh, Mike Rumbles, to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment uh, 16O in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15, Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved. I therefore call them, uh, the question is, is Amendment 16O be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16O is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 16P in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 50, Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 16P be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16B is not agreed. I call Amendment 16Q in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16Q be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Uh, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are 60 votes against, therefore Amendment 16Q is not agreed. 
I now call Amendment 16R in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 16R be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16R is not agreed. I call Amendment 16S in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 16S be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16S is not agreed. I call Amendment T in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 16T be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. There's those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16T is not agreed. I call Amendment 16U in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved, convener. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 16U be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16U is not agreed. I call Amendment 16W in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green, are you going to move it or not move it on his behalf? Pardon me, can you just repeat the amendment number? 16W. Thank you. I moved. The question is that Amendment 16W be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore uh, Amendment 16W is not agreed. I call Amendment 16Z in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 15. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 16Z be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16Z is not agreed. I now call Amendment 16AA in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 15. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 16AA be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AA is not agreed. I call Amendment 16AD in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Okay. I call Amendment 16AE in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Apologies, I had some technical errors in my notes. Moved. The question is that Amendment 16AE be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 16AE is not agreed. I call Amendment 16AF in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 16AF be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AF is not agreed. I call Amendment 16AG in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 
AI in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with Amendment 15. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. The question is that Amendment 16 AI be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AI is not agreed. I call Amendment 16AJ in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 15. Colin Smith to move or not move? Move. The question is, um, Amendment 16AJ be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16 AJ is not agreed. I call Amendment 16 AK in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 15. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 16M in the name of Mike Rumbles, already debated with Amendment 15. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Not moved. OK. I then call Amendment 16 AH in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 15. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, convener, I intend to bring this back at stage three as it would exempt the lowest paid working in our NHS, but I'd like to move this today as well. Thanks. You're going to move it move today? It. OK, so the question is that Amendment 16 AH be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Um, I therefore call a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 16AH is not agreed. Uh, the question uh, now is to ask Mr Finney whether you want to press or withdraw your Amendment 16. Press can be done. The question, therefore, is Amendment 16 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yes. We are agreed. OK, there's a next section is the working place uh, parking and its financial provisions. I'm going to call Amendment 17 in the name of John Finney, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. John Finney, can I ask you to move Amendment <coughs> 17 and speak to all amendments in the group? Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 17 outlines how charges arising from the workplace parking licence will operate. The first and key point is that there is a charge on the occupier of the premises, not on individuals who are parking at their workplace. How and indeed if the levy is recovered from those parking at the workplace is a matter between the employer and employee. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to specifically address the power in subsection 1, subsection B of my amendment because I think it's key to the other amendments in the group. It's important to be clear that the power for Scottish ministers to specify other persons who may be liable is to allow for circumstances where someone other than the occupier of premises should be liable to pay charges for the provision of workplace parking. This would, for example, allow for circumstances where parking spaces at an occupier's premises are leased to another organisation for use by that organisation's employees. The person providing these places to their employees would not be the occupier of the premises at which the spaces are allocated, but would have to hold a licence in respect of those parking spaces. Regulations under subsection 1b of the amendment of Amendment 17 could ensure that this person must also pay charges. The amendment absolutely does not mean that it could be levied on individual employees, since it is restricted to dealing with the recovery of charges imposed under licensing schemes. Under Amendment 7, licensing scheme may only impose charges on people providing workplace parking, not on people using it. That is a crucial distinction here. Schemes cannot regulate if or how a provider who is required to hold a licence may choose to recover charges in respect of that licence from anybody else. The majority of amendments in this group therefore appear to be fundamentally misunderstanding the purpose of subsection 1b. The practical effect of the amendments will not be to provide exemption to employees or to prevent charges from being recovered in any particular circumstances by employers or anybody else liable to pay them. But they could prevent cheap charges imposed by schemes from being recovered from people who provide workplace parking, which is surely not the intention. 
There could be the absurd position under Amendment 17F, for example, that a provider of workplace parking could not be made liable for licence charges because they had children under 12. That cannot be right. The amendment allows for local authorities setting up a scheme to have some flexibility in how it is applied, permitting different charges or indeed no charge to be applied in respect of different days, times, persons, premises and vehicles. This will be a very useful tool for local authorities as they can tailor the scheme to reflect local circumstances and use the scheme to promote other policies. The power to specify different classes of motor vehicles could, for example, support the promotion of ultra-low emission vehicles, which would already address the issue covered by Amendment 17R, allowing again for the local authority to take the lead on what is best for the local area. It's not clear to me whether Amendment 17T and you are intended to ensure no charges are imposed on respective weekends or between the hours of midnight 6am, but in any event, this power already uh, permits local authorities to impose lower or no charges on whichever days and what, at whatever times they wish, with local discretion again empowered. Amendment 17S seeks to require employers seeking to recover charges from employees to put in place plans to meet to means test those charges. My amendments deliver a scheme which is a charge on people who provide workplace parking, not the people who use it. The reason for this is that the occupiers who are providing the workplace parking, and as a result, it is right that they focus on the impact and result of this parking. My amendments are silent on how, if at all, employers recover the charge from employees. It is a matter for employers whether they recover charge, the charge. Evidence from Nottingham is not that all employers do so. Employers may also decide how to recover charges from employees and how much to recover. Again, this committee has heard evidence from Nottingham City Council that employers subject to their scheme can and do vary the charge recovered, depending on factors such as salary of the employee and the, the location within the scheme area of their place of employment. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just on that point then, if it's, is it the case that the member expects that the government would set uh, a national charge, uh, as was discussed with uh, pavement parking and low emission zones, fire uh, a national regulation? but that companies could, in effect, subsidise the charge if it were passed on by making up the difference of what it charges the employee versus what is the company's liable to pay. Is that how the scheme would, in effect, work? I'm not sure I absolutely understand your point, but no, um, that wouldn't be the intention. Seeking to regulate these nuanced matters at a national level would be extremely challenging and may give rise to a greater risk of unfairness than leaving the issue to the discretion and judgment of employers. Amendment, one, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. Amendment 17S requires that employers have a plan for means testing employees. But, that, but what should that cover? Income, outgoings, dependents, debts, as well as being extremely bureaucratic, it is also extraordinarily intrusive. What if an employee doesn't want to share details of their private life with an employer? Why should they be compelled to do so? Amendment 18 underpins a key element of my approach to work, workplace parking levies. Funds raised by the workplace parking licensing scheme can be used for two purposes. The administration costs of the scheme and for the activities to help deliver the local transport strategy. So this is not a simple revenue raising power as some critics suggested. Where a local authority is considering a scheme, it will require a local transport strategy. That is not something that a local authority is required to have. But where a local authority has a strategy, this will be where activities that the workplace parking levy can fund are set out. Where better to have this than as part of a strategy aiming at addressing local transport needs? This should, come, this sh should go some way to providing reassurance on the purpose and outcomes of a WPL. This builds on the transparent and locally fo focused approach adopted in my amendments. The amendment allows for joint working by local authorities where this would benefit the area committing funds. This reflects that transport issues are often framed by travel to work areas rather than local authority boundaries. Amendment 18A would require a financial transfer from a local authority operating a scheme to another local authority where a workplace parking licence charge is levied and that charge is passed on to an employee and that employee lives in another local authority. The principle under a pinning the amendment appears to be that it's unfair 
that people who live out with a local authority area should pay towards transport improvements in that area. But that's really unfair. You could equally argue that it's unfair that people from out with an area who use transport, including local roads in an area, don't contribute. There are issues with the amendment as well as the bureaucracy required. Funds raised through charges will be hypothecated into activities set out in the local transport strategy. The receiving local authority may not have a local transport strategy and in any event would not be required to utilise the funds it receives to improve transport services. It could apply these funds in any way it saw fit. But fundamentally, convener, this is all about the climate emergency we're facing, so we need to, as many tools available as possible to address this. It's disingenuous to claim that people who commute into a neighbouring local authority do not contribute to problems for that authority and do not benefit from transport expenditure by that authority. Amendment 19 uh, gives Scottish ministers largely technical powers in relation to accounts for workplace licensing schemes. This is similar to provisions already in Part 1 of the Bill on LEZs and Part 4 on parking prohibitions. The amendment allows for trans transparency in the keeping of accounts by local authorities, and I would expect that to be uncontroversial. Convener, I move Amendment 17. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. Pauline McNeill, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 17 and speak to any other amendments in the group? Pauline. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 17C is uh, drafted to stop companies passing the charge on to workers, uh, some of which I've already spoken to. Um, if one of the issues is about the funds raised by the workplace levy, I'd uh, like to draw the committee's attention that, based on Nottingham, which is not a dissimilar size to Glasgow, in the case of Glasgow, £9, mil £9 million pounds a year, it's going to take a decade before that fund really builds up to anything that can be spent. And you'll note on the connectivity report, as a result of that, they've asked for over a billion pounds. So you can see that it's not going to raise the kind of funds that's going to change the face of public transport, but it is going to cause a great deal of misery for <coughs> workers. Now that deals with Amendment 17. Um, see, I'm not clear, perhaps, if John Finney, and uh, apologies to John if I've uh, been confused about this, but my understanding is that money is not ring-fenced. Local authorities, uh, Glasgow in particular, is under a great deal of financial pressure. You could understand why they would use the money to spend on other things and not public transport, but I would have more respect for the policy if there was a clear attempt to ring-fence the money for public transport, and it doesn't actually make a great deal of sense to me in terms of the arguments, if it is not ring-fenced for that purpose. It was us trans and their very helpful evidence to the committee. Uh, they did agree that there should be discounts for low-paid workers, and they did seem to acknowledge uh, that there should be poverty-proofing in such a policy. And to deal with the other, other amendments, um, Amendment 17A and 17B provide an exemption for people earning less than the living wage, again, to protect low-paid workers. The living wage is currently £9 an hour, and nearly half a million people uh, 470,000 to be exact in Scotland don't earn the real living wage. Low paid employees may be forced to look elsewhere for work in the worst case scenario. Um, well, that's a legitimate argument, Mr. Lyle. Uh, amendment well, 17 D in a minute, in a minute. 17 D provides an exemption for single parent families. And here I want to draw the committee's attention to the Child Poverty Act. So at stage three of that uh, passage of that bill, we agreed as a parliament to put a measure in to specifically ask the government to address measures in relation to child poverty and single parents in particular, and a specified group within the Child Poverty Act. According to the 2001 <coughs> Scottish Census, there are 170,000 single parents in Scotland with more than 281,000 dependent children. Glasgow has the highest rate of lone parent families. They face many barriers to finding and sustaining employment. It's 17E provides an exemption for... Yes, I'll take an intervention, Mr Lyle. I'd be interested in your, uh, where do you get your information from and how you can back up how many people this would affect. How many people what would affect? Any charge. How many people would it affect? There are many people in Glasgow who take the bus and get to Glasgow. So how many people would this affect? Any people that take the bus? No, how many people would this, your, your, um, your points, how many people well, 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 okay. would end up paying a, a parking levy? 
Well, if there are if no pay, pay and parking charges. Mr. Lyle, I'm oh, sorry. Just, oh, yeah. just hold on. Hold thousands. On. Hold on. Thousands of people Pauline, will, could Pauline, be. Sorry. Can I just remind just the etiquette of doing this? It's not a member to member conversation. So if you'd like to make an intervention, Mr. Lyle, please make it through the chair, and I'm sure Pauline will then answer it. So, <clears throat> Pauline. Convener, in answer to Mr. Lyle, there are tens of thousands of workers who could be potentially affected. Pendant, as you know, it would then be a matter for the local authority, but the local authority in Glasgow has already decided it's going to use it. And there are thousands of workers who could be affected by it. Transport Scotland's own figures show that car usage amongst the low income households is actually relatively high. So the suggestion that all low paid workers get the bus, I think, is a misunderstanding of the profile of the city. In relation to Amendment 7E, uh, there is already an employment gap between disabled people and the rest of the working age population. Disabled people are twice as likely to be unemployed. I think I'm right in saying I know that there's been discussion about the blue badge scheme possibly being exempt, but I think we need to discuss uh, who, uh, if anyone, would be exempt. There's certainly an issue about disabled workers um, who are able to use their cars, um, and we need to make sure that they are not uh, have further burdens on their d daily lives. Amendment 17F provides an exemption for parents with children under 12 or under uh, primary school age. Many parents need to use their cars to do their run before work. Many women in particular, and I don't believe that this has been equality proofed uh, before stage two. Many children in primary school are taken to school by car or van. Uh, more, than, than in more than in secondary, 29% of primary pupils went to school in Scotland by car or van compared with only 18% of secondary pupils. For many parents, the safest form of transport uh, and often primary school pupils don't use public transport because they are too young. So it's a significant issue uh, for parents, convener. I quote at that. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, I'm now going to... Uh, I would normally ask Miles Briggs to move Amendment 17G in his name, but I think, Jamie Green, you're moving it on his behalf. Thank you, convener. And according to protocol, I'll only speak to Miles' amendments and uh, keep my other, other comments to laughter. Other members have had their due place to speak to run amendments, so I will hopefully come back later. But on Miles Briggs Amendment 17G, uh, this, uh, I think, uh, the, the, the premise of this really is to specify that if someone is providing voluntary services uh, at premise, the, the following three premises, an adult health care premise, an adult social care premise, or indeed a hospice, uh, that is defined as somewhere that is uh, for which its purpose is caring for the dying or incurably ill, that anyone who volunteers at such a premise would be exempt from uh, being liable for any charges. Um, again, you know, I appreciate this. We've had a, a long and robust political debate, but I would like to think that anyone who gives up their time to work in these sorts of places, uh, mem I, I can declare an interest in, in that members of my family provide voluntary services uh, at some of these places and do great work, as I'm sure all volunteers do, that at the very least, these people aren't paid, for goodness sake. You know, at least, you know, give them some exemption from these charges. You know, please, can we find some, at least some moral duty to give volunteers uh, exemption? And I think that's the premise of Miles Briggs's... Uh, On that point? Yes, I will, but can I just ask uh, for other members just to let me finish? That would be great, thanks. Um, and Amendment 16, 1, uh, 1C... Um, hospices, we've already voted for them to be exempt. OK, that's very helpful. Thank you. And, and I support that. Um, however, uh, Miles Briggs also wishes to add people who volunteer in the other healthcare environments. And can I give you an example? Uh, anyone who's ever been to hospital and used... Uh, I just disagree. Are your chances to intervene um, r r rather than making those comments over there? So by all means intervene and see if the member will take it. But... but, but. Uh, thank you. If I could continue, uh, just to address the intervention from uh, uh, Ms Ross. Um, yes, it's very welcome that the government, I think, agrees that people who work at hospices are exempt. I presume that will also include those who volunteer. But the addition of these other pre uh, healthcare premises could include the example of people who provide uh, services at uh, the shops and cafes that many hospitals in Scotland provide. Uh, those people are volunteers. Um, I... Uh, I'll just check the, the name of some of the organisations, but we're all aware of them. We all come across them uh, in, when we visit hospitals. Uh, if I could just finish the point, yeah. Um, those people who, uh, who perhaps even work full-time hours but are unpaid, 
um, uh, may re be required to, to, to drive to those locations, uh, especially if they're in hard, hard to reach areas. And I think that's the premise of uh, Mr. Miles Briggs's uh, amendments. I'm happy to convey to the Cabinet Secretary if you have further comments. I don't know if the member's unclear about how the level will apply because it's applied on the basis of premises. So if you're a volunteer at a hospice, if it's been exempt, it's, not, it's, it's got an exemption from it, you, you're exempt from it because the premise is exempt. So if the local authority decide that a particular facility is to be exempt from it, then it's exempt. In, so it's, 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 a, it's a premises levy, it's not an individual levy. Indeed, but Cabinet Secretary, these places aren't exempt because you voted not to exempt them. So what, you know, what a ridiculous argument to make. You, you, you had the opportunity and your members had the opportunity to exempt these types of places. It's a premises, including if, it's not sorry, an individual. If you individual. want to intervene, please intervene. Don't shout at me from uh, across the room. You fundamentally um, look, getting it please, wrong. Let, please let me make no, the point. Hold on, hold on, sorry. I've said this and I'm not going to keep repeating myself. The committee is not conversation. We're trying to get through legislation. So if you want to have conversations across the room, please could you could you do it through the chair and ask to to ask me or, or to ask a member to take an intervention. But shouting at each other across the room really I don't think is very helpful, um, and and it could lead to um, anarchy if that was allowed to continue, which I'm sure, Cabinet Secretary, you won't want to achieve. Now, Mr. Green. Thank you. Uh, if I could continue on what I think is quite a serious matter, actually, members, and that's that the Cabinet Secretary is right, is that if a place is exempt, then by default, whether you're paid or otherwise, you will be exempt. But because the committee has chosen not to exempt these premises, then this amendment at least seeks to exempt those who volunteer at those premises as a backup. So I would implore members to think carefully about the people, the sort of people that we meet in our interactions as MSPs in these establishments, that if they were not exempt because the local authority had chosen not to exempt them, at the very least give those volunteers the opportunity to be exempt. And we can the decide that. An and, and I've just finished my comments. We, and you, you can speak to other, other amendments if you wish when it's your opportunity. Um, we can at least exempt these, these types of people who, who volunteer at these organisations, at the very least, and that can be set as a national standard, and I think it's the right thing to do, and I would implore members to support that amendment. Thank you, Jamie. I now call Michelle Ballantyne to speak to Amendment 17H and any other amendments in the group. Michelle. OK, thank you. I'll try and keep this relatively brief, um, and I thank the committee for allowing me to speak this morning, and I would just refer you to my register of interest before I do so. The amendments I've lodged in this bill seek to secure exemptions from the scheme for individuals receiving benefit payments. Um, 17H secures exemptions for individuals in receipt of short-term assistance, while IJNK, 17IJNK, provide exemptions, exemptions for individuals in receipt of universal credit, job seekers allowance, employment support, respectively. Furthermore, amendments 17L, M and N would secure exemptions for individuals in receipt of disability living allowance, personal independence payment and carers allowance. The reason for lodging these exemptions is because I believe people that are in receipt of benefits are already at the lower end of our earning scale and who are actively trying to get back into the workplace to increase gradually their work hours. And I think this does two things. If you provide national exemption, it ensures consistency in terms of those people who are in receipt of benefits to be confident that if they go into the workplace, they may not end up having to pay if they part there. Secondly, and I've listened to the arguments very carefully this morning, that if you are suggesting that businesses are picking up the tab for that parking, it may contribute to actively encouraging businesses to employ people who might otherwise have difficulty getting into the employment market, and particularly for people who have disabilities who currently do struggle to get employment, it may provide an extra incentive for businesses to, to so employ. Now, I would also add to this, um, because I, I do believe there is a risk, um, and particularly where we're talking about cross-boundary risk, for most of the people who sit within this category, they cannot afford to live in the cities. They are often pushed to the edges or outside of the cities, but they seek employment within the city boundary, and therefore will be potentially caught by this. Secondly, businesses already pay rates on their parking spaces because that is part of the rateable value of um, 
an organisation's premises. So actually what we will be doing is double charging business for this. That may be fine if you're a highly profitable um, service-led industry, but for example for manufacturing where margins are much tighter, that will pose considerable problems. So I do think you, it is important that you consider national exemptions on some areas, this being one of them. Um, I'm pleased that you've welcomed um, exemptions for the NHS, but I think many people on benefits, for example, will be questioning why highly paid NHS staff are entitled to a national exemption where they, on, on the minimum wages and struggling to get back into the workplace and provide for their families do not receive that kind of same exemption. So I hope you, you will actually think about this and consider it. Yes. Can I just clarify, the member understands that we're talking about the places being taxed here, not the person. So the, as far as the legislation is concerned, it doesn't dif differentiate between higher or lower paid employees. Yes. And it would only be if the employer wanted to pass on or cut the pay or something of the person that that, that would come into effect. And I made reference to that in my comments. What I said to you was where a business is, um, is not prohibited from passing it on, and my understanding from the legislation you are putting together here is that it doesn't prohibit an employer from passing on that cost. So first of all, that may well, hang on, let me, let me finish, that may well happen. Secondly, if they do not pass it on as a direct charge to the employee, it will inevitably, in businesses with low margins, affect the rates they can pay. So by default, as an unintended consequence of your actions, it will affect the earnings of the lowest paid. So yes, I understand exactly what you're trying to do here. I understand that you're imposing it as a place charge, not as an individual charge. But I say to all of you that when you make law, it always has unintended consequences. And I do not believe that in some of your debate here, you have considered some of those unintended consequences in entirety and I do not believe that you have shown adequate understanding of how business operates and the impact you will have on business who are already paying for that parking. We'll give way. Yes. Yes. Hey, thank you again for giving way. But I mean if, if it was say theoretically reflected in a lower pay increase next year, there is no way this Parliament can intervene or be involved in that. So effectively if an employer was to give a lower pay increase other than going below the minimum wage, eh, we cannot possibly enforce that. But that's the whole point, isn't it? Government's actions have, have effect in the, in the real world. And the consequences of your decision-making in this committee and within this bill will have effect in the real world. And you are, it is incumbent on all of us when we come to vote on this bill, and it's incumbent on all of us when considering the amendments coming before this bill, to consider the potential consequences of the decisions you make. I've listened really carefully this morning to a lot of this debate. Some of it makes good sense. Some of it, I think, shows a, a huge degree of naivety around the real world. But I am saying to you that the people who always suffer the most when we make these kind of laws are the people on lowest incomes. And I am saying to you, if you, if you are seriously sitting here and telling me you think it is imperative that there is a national exemption for NHS employees based on their contribution to society, the need for what they do, how can you possibly say there is no need to actually protect those who are on the lowest and there is no need within it to try and ensure opportunity and encouragement for businesses as well because I, I, think, I think you're really missing the point. Yes, certainly. I, I, I really get you know, your, your concern but we you so concerned when your party brought in the bedroom tax oh, for and people, and whoa, people whoa, had whoa, to pay that. Mr Lyle, oh, no. Mr Lyle. Fair comment. Fair comment. Mr Lyle, Fair comment. Mr Lyle. Fair comment. Mr. Lyle, but Mr. Green, hold on, hold on, everyone. I just, you know, in fairness, we're looking at the car parking or the, uh, and working place parking levy. To actually throw comments like that, I don't think are helpful. Michelle, I think you've come to the. Sorry, Mr. Lyle. I said I know you don't feel not helpful. Now, now, Mr. Lyle, with the greatest respect to you, 
as convener of this, this group, I think I believe I show a remarkable amount of impartiality when it comes to things. I never and, I do, and I don't pass comment. And I would ask if you would respect and treat me the same way that you would the presiding officer, which means that you don't answer back when I'm speaking, because I think that is rude and shows disrespect to the parliamentary system. Now, Michelle has finished her speaking. I'm going to call Maurice Corrie <coughs> to, move, um, uh, sorry, to speak to Amendment 17 Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I speak to 17-0, uh, and I also declare that I'm an Armed Forces veteran. Uh, this amendment covers both uniformed and serving personnel, regular reservists and cadets and civilian instructors serving with all, within all our military units and in all military bases and training areas in Scotland, which are Crown property. <laughs> Operationally, they are there, and many of our um, uh, personnel have to be available 24 hours per day, and at some cases there are notice to move at short notice. Uh, to move. Therefore, um, they require their vehicles to attend up for duty uh, at all hours and where the public transport is not available or is limited, uh, particularly in rural and out of town areas. And therefore, I move Amendment 17 uh, 0 accordingly. Convener. Thank you, uh, Morris. And can I ask Colin Smith, please, to move Amendment 17 P and talk to the other amendments in the group? Uh, Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to move uh, Amendment 17P in my name, which would exempt low earners um, uh, as defined by ministers and regulations. As it stands, this regressive levy will hit the worst off hardest, and this amendment looks to address this should employers pass the levy on to employees. And let's be clear, this can and will be passed on by many employers. Uh, indeed, the SNP spokesperson for Transport in Glasgow City Council, when given evidence to this committee, argued that it will only work if it is passed on to workers. And let me read what Councillor Richardson said to this committee. Passing the levy on is one of the the, the tools to enable behavioural change. What is being passed on in the levy is the disincentive to drive. So let's be very clear, the SNP in Glasgow, if they bring in this levy, will pass it on to drivers. Now, Amendment 17Q looks to exempt those without access to public transport. It is unfair, in my view, to penalise those with no other option but to use their car to get to work. Amendment 17R would exempt those driving ultra-low emission vehicles. If the purpose of this scheme is to reduce emissions, I cannot see why a person driving an ultra-low emission vehicle should have to pay the charge, particularly when they have already paid the additional expense of purchasing such a vehicle to do the right thing and reduce their emissions. Failure to support this amendment would show that the levy has nothing to do with the environment and simply a budget decision designed by the Greens and SNP to provide a fig... If you let me finish my sentence, I might. This, 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 movement, this, this provision is designed, frankly, to have a, a fig leaf to cover up for the budget decision to cut funding to local councils. I'll give away to Mr Mason. I yeah, thank the member very much for giving way. Would you accept that congestion is also a problem in the city, and even if we uh, fill the city centres with electric cars, we still have a problem? Well, the reality is that if, if, if Mr Mason is saying that he's not opposed to electric vehicles being one of the solutions to the emissions, then, frankly, uh, we have a real challenge on our hands when it comes to the environment. Uh, <laughs> Amendment 17S in my name calls for employers to introduce a scheme so that the amount paid by employees varies according to income, such as the one described uh, to the committee by Nottingham Council. This will ensure greater fairness should this levy be introduced. In my view, taxes should be progressive. This levy, in my view, is very much regressive. Um, amendment 18A say, says that when the cost of the levy is met by an employee, the money raised should go to the local authority in which they are resident. It is unfair that people living outside cities, often with no good public transport links, should have to pay the levy because of a lack of public transport in air, their area, but not have the proceeds of that levy spent on improving the poor public transport that has meant they have had to use the car in the first place. This is an issue that I have raised on numerous occasions uh, to this committee. And I have to say the the Cabinet Secretary said this committee isn't listening to the evidence. The reality is the Cabinet Secretary is failing to listen to the evidence. There needs to be a solution <laughs> to this particular issue. Sestrans provided a solution when they gave evidence to this committee and argued strongly that the levy should be done on a strategic basis so it deals with this anomaly where, and I'll give the example again, somebody in the borders would have to pay the levy 
because they worked in Edinburgh and have no choice but to use their car because there is no public transport and no money raised in Edinburgh will go to improve public transport in the borders. The way to deal with that issue is to allow the levy to be done on a more strategic basis. Now, I appreciate this means looking at transport on a strategic basis, which is something the government don't do often enough, but I would hope that the Cabinet Secretary will listen to the evidence being given to this committee and take a far more strategic approach to this proposal. Thank you, Colin. And I now call Tom Mason to speak to Amendment 17T and other amendments in the group. Tom. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I first of all um, draw attention of the committee to my um, register of interest, particularly I'm an Aberdeen City Councillor? And uh, exceptionally around this table, I'll be one of the people who have to deal with this particular act as it comes into being. And no doubt the local government will be pressured to, to, to use it in order to supplement its funds not received from central government being short for change this year by at least 26 million. However, I also um, put, associate with the words of Colin Smythe in terms of the lack of strategic thought in this total bill. If there is a problem with congestion and resolves it by congestion, cars parked do not cause any congestion at all. So why put the levy on parking when it should be on road charging if that's going to solve the, if it is going to solve the congestion problem? And certainly trying to tax electric cars doesn't strike me as being any sense whatsoever. However, as to the amendments, there are quite small amendments. The first one, 17T, is simply in order to define what a, work, not, what a normal working week is. In other words, it's not 24 hours a day. It's just five days a week and only j during the day. And the second amendment is simply to exempt those institutions which are government inspired institutions, what is the point of charging levy in any way on those if you're going to collect, if you're robbing people, Peter to pay Paul? So not, not particularly central. So, so any government thing should be exempt. But then you, if you do this, of course, you're in problems where you've got pork barrel politics in local government, which determines exactly what's going on. And this is opening the situation of disharmony in local government. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tom and Jamie Green. And then I've got two members, Dan, who wish to, to speak, uh, but uh, Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 17U and other amendments not already covered. Uh, thank you, Convener. Is, uh, does this mean I also can speak to other amendments? Uh, there's no other members queuing for uh, moving their own amendments, okay. is that correct? No, uh, no I, if, you just speak, if you speak to Amendment 17U, I've got you down to speak after Mike Rumbles. That's so Mike Rumbles will come in first and then you. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you, Convener. Uh, happy to only speak, therefore, to 17U in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend uh, uh, basically an exclusion uh, that uh, people who uh, work on social hours when public transport is n simply not available, not just uh, scarce, uh, between the hours of midnight and 6am, which should encompass many shift workers uh, who simply have to drive uh, to get to their places of work. Uh, I think this is a, a sensible amendment. Um, uh, you know, the idea that someone can get a bus at 11.30 at night to their place of work uh, in, in many parts of Scotland is just simply not an option. Uh, and I think if we are to introduce uh, these amendments as proposed, uh, then at the very least uh, we should acknowledge that there are many people uh, who have to take their cars to work, to work on sociable hours. Uh, we uh, should place the importance uh, on shift workers. Um, these people should be exempt and this amendment seeks to do so and I hope it will achieve the support of the committee. Thank you. I've got Mike Rumbles followed by Jamie Green and any other members if they'd like to indicate they'd like to come in. Mike. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've tried in the whole of this bill um, to put forward amendments which I think are constructive and helpful uh, to improve the bill. Um, and I think John Finney's amendments 17, 18 and 19 do improve the bill. Um, I mean, I opposed his previous amendments, but if we have to have them in, then I will be voting for his 17, 18 and 19 because it makes sure that the charges are paid, uh, that the charges, the income comes 
directly to the area um, that should benefit from it. Um, and it makes it clear that it is the occupier of the premises that are charged. So I'll be supporting those amendments. Um, I also want to make it clear, because there seem to be some strange comments about this. The whole, the whole point, about, as I understand it, the whole point of John Finney's whole series of amendments and the whole point of the workplace levy is to make people use their cars less. And if you're going to make people use their cars less, that levy will have to be passed on to the drivers, otherwise there isn't a point. Well, what is the point if, you, if those aren't passed on? So, um, I mean, that's what, that's what I accept. If we go down this route, they have to be passed on, and that's the, that was the problem. And I would be in favour of this approach if we didn't put the cart before the horse. If we had areas where we had decent public transport that could encourage people to move from their cars to, uh, to public transport, uh, if we had that system in place in the first place, then this would be more logical. It's not logical putting the cart before the horse. Um, all the amend I will be voting against all the, all the other amendments in the group from, from colleagues that have put forward amendments because I do actually think uh, this would not, if they passed, they would not improve the bill because the bill, uh, the, the, the amendments are focused on the occupier of the premises. And I know they're well intentioned, but just to give you an example, um, Pauline McNeill's amendments. I don't see how, I don't see how we in legislation can prevent a charge in one form or the other being passed on. After all, isn't that the purpose of the exercise? So I don't understand that. Um, so another one on Pauline McNeill 17A: Regulations under subsection 1B must provide that a person who earns less than the living wage is exempt from being specified for liable for the charges. But again, it's the premises that are being charged not the individual. And by the way, you can have very high earners who don't earn. I mean, they can take their money in dividends. Can I, take I certainly will. Thank you very much. Um, I, I lay these amendments because um, during the process of the evidence session, some members were saying that the, the charges don't need to be passed on. That was said during the passage of the bill. Uh, it's been a little bit confusing. Uh, I do agree with the member that it seems to me that the policy intention is to pass it on. So I laid this amendment to test this argument to see, well, what is it we're trying to do here? Because uh, we need to be clear what the policy intention is, at least. So it seems to me, if members are saying that it doesn't need to be passed on, could be wrong in saying that Mr Mason might have said this. Apologies if you didn't. Um, therefore, if, if if that is the case, then what would be the problem in removing the, cha the, the, the possibilities that companies can pass it on to workers? Why don't we just put that in the legislation? I understand where you're coming from in that case. So, and in fact, from what you're saying, it sounds to me that you won't be pressing them. In that case, there won't be a vote on it. But to give you an example, your 17, uh, Pauline McNeill 17D, um, regulations may not apply to a person who is the parent of a child living in a single parent household. What is that? I mean, you can have a very wealthy single person business owner. So why do this? So I don't quite understand the point that is, that is being made there. I, I reiterate the point. I think the amendments are well intentioned. They miss the point of the bill. Uh, and the, the, the whole, as I see it, the whole point of John, and, and, and correct me if I'm, I'd be happy to take an intervention of John if I've got this wrong from him, but the whole point of John Finney's amendment is to change behaviour. It is to change, it is to move people from driving their cars onto public transport. But my problem with John's approach has always been if we don't have the public transport in place, how can you be effective in, in changing behaviour? Of course. Well, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, he raises a number of points. I mean, one is that would he at least accept that in the city centres of Glasgow and Edinburgh we do have pretty good public transport and people generally can get there without using their car? And secondly, would he accept that um, the, an employer has various options? One is to pass them on, the charge, but one is to reduce the number of parking spaces so that actually there is few, are fewer cars and there is less congestion. And the third one is obviously to absorb, if it's a profitable company, profit, uh, absorb the cost themselves. 
I, I thank the member for that intervention. My whole point earlier on in the amendments, I, I thought were constructive amendments that I put in, was just that, that very point that John Mason makes. If Edinburgh City Council were convinced that they had a decent public uh, transport service, then they could um, um, put this in. My, my amendment was designed to ensure that it wasn't, didn't go in somewhere that didn't have a decent public service because the whole point is to change behaviour. The whole point is to move people out from cars onto, train, uh, onto trains or buses or what, whatever it is, public transport. And that's why I think we're making bad legislation because we're putting the cart before the horse. And so I, I come back to the specific uh, amendments in front of us. I just wanted to say that I will be supporting John Finney's amendments there because they do improve what the committee has voted for, even though I didn't vote for it. Uh, and that's the whole focus of my attention of this whole process. And the job of the committee is to improve the legislation. I just wish that member... Yeah. Said that he's opposed to the other amendments in, in this, um, this this area, but he hasn't addressed the issue. I mean, he mentioned that the cart before the horse rally is in part of my region more likely to get a horse than you are to get in a bus. To be perfectly honest, and those constituents are the ones that will be penalised because they'll be paying the levy by travelling into the city to work, but they don't have the public transport. But as the bill is currently written, none of the money will be spent in improving public transport in the area. My amendment seeks to improve that by sharing it uh, uh, more, more widely, and surely that's something we should be looking to do. I, I, I don't see how you can um, focus on uh, on the person, that person paying these rather than the employer. I just don't see how you can you can get round it because it's too easily to get round. It misses the whole point of the purpose of John Finney's amendment to the bill. Um, so I, I won't be supporting that. I'm trying, as I say, to do what I think is the right thing, which is to improve John, uh, improve the bill uh, with John Finney's 17, 18, and 19. That does that, even though I don't like what John has done in the first place, but at least we can mitigate what he has done. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, uh, sorry, I think he'd come to the end of his thing, so he... No, 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 no. I just no, well, want to say something. Um, I have to leave because I have to attend another meeting and I just want to fine. thank as you for letting as me speak. As and I've instructed Jamie Green on, on my amendments moving. Thank you. Is that okay? Yep, perfect. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Jamie Green, you wanted to speak next. So I have no other members down to speak thank apart from Jamie. You. Thank you, Governor. Um, the, after our short break, it's been an interesting debate um, about some of the mechanics of how the, uh, the, the schemes might work. Um, Mr Rumbles, I appreciate... Uh, is, is seeking to improve what's already passed, in a sense, and I, I totally respect his, his uh, modus operandi. So I think to improve the bill, we would delete 17, 18 and 19, so I will not be supporting any of them. Um, but given the conversation we're having, let's look at some of the amendments, because we have to vote on some of these amendments if they're moved. And actually, let's actually look at what we're voting on. And I think it's important we do that, just take a step back from this. Uh, some of these amendments are quite interesting um, and I think quite helpful. For example, uh, if you take the uh, amendments regarding uh, exemption for people driving electric vehicles, well, I thought we were trying to encourage people into electric cars. So why would we then charge them for moving from carbon-based vehicles to electric cars and then charging them for driving those electric cars to work? Um, People will be making these shifts because of other pieces of, of legislation in this bill uh, in terms of setting up a low emission zones. Um, so why on earth would we then give them that benefit of not charging them for entering cities through the zones and then hitting them with a charge as they park their electric car at their place of work? How is that going to get us from 0.7% ownership of electric cars in Scotland to anywhere near the sorts of levels that government and probably other members have uh, desires to reach. Um, so that in itself is, is something we definitely should support. Um, but looking at some of the other sensible amendments, I mean, I think I'm, you know, the, the points that Michelle Ballantyne were trying to make around this argument around whether this is a, a, a levy on places or people. And I think that's a key point. I know Mr Mason's uh, spoke about this a few times. Uh, he d in others, there is a point that this is a levy on places, but that's only because that's how it's been constructed. We, we, so we are, you know, we are creating 
uh, the law through these processes. This was never in the bill in the first place. These are amendments to a transport bill that the government brought forward. So we can amend those amendments, and that's what we're trying to do. So if we want to make it about people, we can make it about people. It doesn't have to be about places. And the point of many of the amendments that these uh, are discussing, from Miles Briggs, uh, from Pauline McNeill, from Colin Smith, and from Michelle Ballantyne, are shifting the focus from the place to the person, because ultimately that's who will be paying the levies. It's people at the end of the day. And whether those people are the employers of small businesses or the workers in those businesses, it's still the people. And there are certain groups of people that should be exempt. And that's the whole point of these groupings. People who are in receipt of uh, benefits and who also are able to work. I don't have the numbers to hand, but I'm sure there are many thousands of people in Scotland who uh, are in receipt of some form of benefit and are able and do choose to work. Why should they have to pay it? Um, what about uh, people who, and for goodness sake, what about people who are driving adapted cars because of disabilities? Are we really suggesting we're going to charge them as well? I mean, what on earth is this committee doing? I mean, let's have a real long, hard look at ourselves. If we're not going to exempt places, then let's think about exempting people and let's think about those people that we want to get into the workplace, not put off. And charging them for, to park at work is not the way to get them back in to workplace. I'll stop my comments there. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, no other committee member wishes to speak, say, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 17 in many ways is the heart of workplace parking licensing schemes. The amendment is explicit that the charge applies to the occupier of the premises, not the employee. As John Finney has made clear, the powers in 17.1b to specify other persons who can have charges imposed on them is absolutely not about requiring employees or anybody else using workplace parking to pay the charges. It cannot do that. I therefore agree that the amendments in this... Yes, happy to go away. I agree entirely with what you've said, but surely the intention is to change behaviour, to move people out of their cars onto public transport, and therefore the intention of this amendment is to make sure that that, is, that charge is passed on to the employee, surely? There's a, there's a variety of options which are available to uh, premise owners. Uh, for example, uh, in Nottingham, uh, the university repurposed a large part of its car park uh, for uh, other use. Uh, employers could do that. They could decide to reduce the amount of parking spaces which they make available in order to encourage people to make use of public transport as well. They could turn it into a green space if they wanted to. So there are other options available to employers if they choose to do so. I therefore uh, convene and agree that the amendments in this group, which seek to amend or make provision about the exercise of the powers in subsection 1b uh, of Amendment 17, in order to prevent or restrict imposition of charges on people who use workplace parking, are misconceived, and I therefore cannot support them. Subsection 2 of Amendment 17 is very important. It gives local authorities the flexibility to vary how the scheme applies. This is the very opposite of the restrictive approach that has been claimed for the scheme and indeed would be imposed on local authorities by some of the amendments proposed today. This flexibility is to be welcomed as it gives local authorities the scope to address at a local level many of the concerns that have been raised by varying charges for different days, different times, different premises or different classes of vehicle. It also allows local authorities to act in a proactive way, for example, to promote low-carbon vehicles. Amendment 17 also requires local authorities to consider how they will direct the funds raised by schemes when setting charges. This is also addressed further in Amendment 18. This makes crystal clear that a workplace licensing scheme is not simply a revenue-raising exercise. I'm very clear that it is our responsibility to set the framework for workplace parking levies and then allow local authorities flexibility to apply these in ways that are sensitive to local circumstances, and the provisions in Amendment 17 do this. Amendment 18 provides clear direction on how funds raised should be used. It doesn't say what funds should be used on, 
but requires the local authority proposing a scheme as a local, it has a local transport strategy and funds raised should go to the facilitation of that strategy. A workplace parking licensing scheme should only be proposed where it is going to help meet wider objectives. As these objectives need to be clearly set out, which is the role of the local transport strategy in making sure there is a clear strategic objective being set. The objectives and the local transport strategy will be identified and they will be agreed locally. This will in turn inform the scheme, which will, with the exception of the national exemptions, be, local, be agreed locally. So I am comfortable that Amendment 18 sits well with the localism approach. The amendment also facilitates joint working, which I know was a concern for some stakeholders. And in allowing for the administration costs of the scheme to be met from the funds raised by the scheme, so it should be self-sustaining. I cannot support Amendment 18A, which seeks to require a local authority operating a scheme to transfer any charges recovered from employees resident in another local authority area to that other local authority, not least because it would dilute the funding available to a local authority operating a scheme to make the necessary improvements to transport infrastructure and services to meet the scheme's objectives, but also because the authority receiving those funds would not be required to apply them to improve transport in its area. However, I am happy to support Amendment 19 as a necessary regulating, regulation making power which is consistent with the rest of the bill. As John Finney said, allowing for transparency in the keeping of accounts in relation to workplace parking license, licensing. In summary, convener, I would ask the committee to support John Finney's amendments in this group should they be pressed to the vote. And I would invite other members not to move their amendments in this group. But if they are moved, I would invite the, the committee to reject them. Cabinet Secretary, uh, John Finney, uh, can I ask you to wind up on Amendment 17, please. Yeah, nothing further to add. Thank you, Camina. Thank you very much, Mr Finney, for, for being so succinct. Thank you. Pauline McNeil, can I ask you to wind up on Amendment 17C and press or withdraw it, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I intend to uh, press Amendment 17C, A and B and Amendment D. Um, I do think there's no point in this Parliament passing laws on anti-poverty measures and not making sure they're in the framework. Um, the, the reason that I include the single parents in it is because the single parents are um, recorded as being one of the groups uh, which uh, profile as being the lowest paid and lone parents are specifically mentioned in the Child Poverty Act for that reason. I'll not be pressing 17E and 17F. Thank you. Uh, so the Having pressed Amendment 17C, the, the question is, sorry, yeah, the, the question is that Amendment 17C be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Okay. There's. Um, one vote for, ten votes against, so uh, Amendment 17C is not agreed. Yeah. So I call Amendment 17A in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Move. The question is that 17, Amendment 17A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. 17A. Okay. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17A is not agreed. Sorry, can I just clarify, Pauline, just so I've got in my brain, which ones were you not moving? E and F. Okay, well, I've got, sorry, the clerks tell me I've got to call them. Uh, to follow procedure. So I call Amendment 17D in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17, to move or not move, Pauline? Move. So the question is, is that Amendment 17D be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are four votes for, there's seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17D is not agreed. I call Amendment 17A in the name of Paulie McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17, Paulie McNeill to move or not move. E. e. So not what moved. did I say? E. Oh, you've got to be confused. Said, Sorry, my brain is, must be completely gone. E, Let me try moved. that again for the record then. I call Amendment 17E in the name of Paulie McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17, Paulie McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Okay, thank you. I therefore call Amendment F in the name of Paulie McNeill, already debated with Amendment 17, Paulie McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment G in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 17, uh, Jamie Green to move or not move on his behalf. Not moved. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 17H in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, Jimmy Green to move or not move on her behalf? 17H move. OK, the question is that Amendment 17H be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there's seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17H is not agreed. I call Amendment 17I in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, uh, Jamie Green to move or not move on her behalf. Thank you. If it's helpful, Convener, uh, I won't be moving in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, 17I, J, K, L, I'll call M them when I get to them. You have to J do them individually. Okay, that's through. fine. So, so not moved, therefore. OK. So I call Amendment 17J in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated not with moved. amendments. Not moved. I call Amendment 17K in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, move or not move, Jamie. Not moved. I call Amendment L in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, to move or not move, Jamie Green. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment M in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, move or not move, Jamie Green. Not moved. I call Amendment N in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, already debated with Amendment 17, uh, Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment O in the name of Maurice Corrie, already debated with Amendment 17, Maurice Corrie to move or not move? Moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 17 O be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17O is not agreed. I call Amendment 17P in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. The question is that Amendment 17P be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for and seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17P is not agreed. I call Amendment 17Q in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? Let move. The question is that Amendment 17Q be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17Q is not agreed. I call Amendment 17R. In the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? Let it move. The question is that Amendment 17R be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. <laughs> you can keep it up, Richard. <laughs> and those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17R is not agreed. I call Amendment 17T in the name of Tom Mason, already debated with Amendment 17. Tom Mason to move or not move? Thank you. I call Amendment 17U in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 17. Uh, Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 17V in the name of Tom Mason, already debated with Amendment 17. Tom Mason to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 17B in the name of Paulie McNichol, already debated. McNeil. McNeil. Sorry, how very rude of me. I apologise profusely. Trying to rush, which is a mistake. Call Amendment 17B in the, Paul, in the name of Pauline McNeil, already debated with Amendment 17. Pauline McNeil yes, to move moving, or yeah. not move? Yes, moving. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 17B 
uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. <clears throat> we are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are four votes for, seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 17B is not agreed. I call Amendment 17S in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, move. The question is, the Amendment 17S be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are seven votes against, therefore Amendment 17S is not agreed. John Finney, can I ask you to press or with you withdraw Amendment 17? Press, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 17 uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Oh, almost caught out. Those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for, there are four votes against, therefore Amendment 17 is agreed. I call Amendment 18 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 17. John Finney, to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. I therefore call Amendment 18A in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 17. Colin Smith, to move or not move? move. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. A. Rushing again. There we go. 18A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Therefore, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes for. There are seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 18A is not agreed. John Finney, can I ask you to press or withdraw Amendment 18? Press, convener. The question, therefore, is Amendment 18 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. I therefore call those in favour, uh, please raise their hands. And those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, Amendment 18 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 19 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 17. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, Amendment 19 is agreed. Oh, I get a break now. I'm going to call Amendment 20 in the name of John Finney. Group with amendments are shown in the groupings. John Finney, can I ask you to move Amendment 20 and speak to the amendments in the group? John. Um, certainly, uh, Convener, yes. Uh, amendment 20 gives Scottish ministers the power to make regulations around enforcement of the workplace parking licensing scheme. This includes penalty charges which the occupier will be liable for. In practice, this is expected to focus on issues around occupiers not being licensed or providing a higher number of workplace parking places than covered by the licence held. Amendment 21 gives Scottish ministers the power to specify approved devices for the collection of evidence and the process for using that evidence in proceedings related to possible failure to comply with a workplace licensing scheme. For example, I understand that in Nottingham, mobile cameras are used to monitor enforcement. Amendment 22 sets out the enforcement and investigation powers available to local authorities, including rights of entry. These are tightly focused and targeted at investigating breaches of requirements of licensing schemes and license conditions, as well as um, the serving of penalty charge notices. The powers available include a right of entry and a right to require the production of information. And, and, and to keep a copy of that information. Uh, the power of entry cannot be used to gain access to premises used as a dwelling. Amendment 23 allows a warrant to be obtained from a sheriff to exercise the enforcement powers in Amendment 24 in circumstances where access to premises has been or is likely to be refused or where the premises are unoccupied. Amendment 24 sets out conditions for the exercise of powers under Amendment 22. It requires that the warrant is enforced at a reasonable time of day. The authorised person enforcing the warrant must provide proof of identity and authorisation if requested. The authorised person can take other persons and equipment as required. If they remove any items, they must leave a statement of what is taken and who took it. 
and where the premises are unoccupied, they must be left as secure as they were in entry. The amendment also creates offences where a person refuses to comply with a reasonable instruction or is obstructive. I must say that uh, I'm rather surprised at Amendment 24A, which seeks to remove these offences. With schemes of this nature, any reasonable person would expect it to come with enforcement provisions. I can only imagine that the intent here is to effectively hobble the enforcement of the scheme and thus the scheme itself. I cannot support that amendment. Amendment 25 deals with the powers of entry onto Crown land and requires certain permissions to be attained before these powers can be exercised. This is a standard approach where powers of entry may be exercised in relation to such land. It does not mean that those named would be exempt from the workplace parking licensing scheme. I move Amendment 20. Thank you very much, uh, John. And I'm now going to call Liam Kerr's Amendment to 24A. But I, Jamie Green, I think you're speaking to it. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is a, 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 an amendment in the name of Liam Kerr. He's not here, obviously, so I'll do my best to interpret the amendment in his absence uh, by leaving out subsections 7 and 8. I think, as Mr uh, Finney alluded to, uh, it seeks to uh, remove the language around uh, uh, whether someone is committing an offence uh, the person, how the person commits an offence and what the uh, liability is for the committing of such an offence. My understanding is that Mr Kerr was unhappy with the idea uh, that people will uh, seek orders and warrants to force their way into businesses and that businesses and business owners may be subject to uh, uh, offences uh, under this levy. Uh, indeed, uh, these licensing schemes are set up in a way that could criminalise people if they uh, were uh, deemed not to be uh, enforcing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the schemes. Um, I don't think we should be criminalising uh, our businesses uh, for providing parking. Uh, I think creating an offence in the form of an amendment to a transport bill uh, is a very odd place to start creating such offences, which could result in uh, convictions and fines uh, which include the statutory, up to the statutory maximum uh, uh, on people. Um, I do wonder uh, what effect that has on uh, people's, uh, uh, in terms of their, their history of criminality, um, whether it remains on records or indeed it has any negative effect on them as individuals or as companies. Um, I think that's the premise of Mr Kerry. He's not here to speak for himself, I'm sure, if he's interested in in talking to this at stage three, it may be something he wishes to explore further. But I think the premises of it is really, it sends off a terrible message if we uh, are giving uh, sweeping powers to uh, people f uh, with warrants to go in and, and, uh, and, and force their way into uh, companies and businesses simply to enforce this ridiculous tax. Thank you, Jamie. Um, no other members indicated they want to speak. Just, just for members' information, I tend to uh, press on, which will take me slightly over time to the end of this section, uh, because once the Cabinet Secretary has spoken and uh, John has wound up, it is just a series of votes. So, Cabinet Secretary, to you. Give you an amendment 20 to 25 in John Finney's name, put in place enforcement provisions in relation to workplace parkings parking licensing schemes. These schemes are to be enforced by way of civil penalty charges and Amendment 20 gives the Scottish Ministers the power to set out the detail or in some cases to allow schemes to set out the detail as to matters such as the level of charges, uh, when those charges should be imposed and reviews and appeals of charges. Amendment 21 is a further power for the Scottish Ministers to approve devices for use in the enforcement of licensing schemes and for the use of evidence from those devices for enforcement purposes. Amendment 22 to 24 confer enforcement powers in respect of workplace parking licensing schemes on persons authorised by local authorities to exercise those powers. These powers are narrowly constrained so that they may only be used to investigate breaches of scheme requirements or license conditions or to serve penalty charge notices. It is anticipated that entry into premises will be arranged by agreement in such cases, but where entry is refused, there is a power to obtain a warrant from a sheriff. 
I consider the powers conferred by these amendments to, uh, necessary or to be necessary uh, and proportionate uh, in dealing with the issue of workplace parking licensing schemes in order to effectively monitor and enforce any scheme. They contain significant safeguards against misuse, and I support the amendments. I do not support Amendment 24 in Liam Kerr's name. It is not clear why Mr Kerr would propose that obstructing a duly authorised enforcement officer exercising powers conferred under an Act of this Parliament should go unpunished. While it may be that an offence of this kind would be used sparingly in practice, without the option there would be nothing to discourage licence holders and others from refusing to cooperate with those tasked with monitoring compliance with these schemes. In summary, convener, I reiterate my support for John Finney's amendments in this group, and I would ask the committee to support them too. And I would ask Liam Kerr not to move Amendment 24A, but if it is moved, for the committee to reject it. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, John Finney, um, can I ask you to wind up, please? And press will withdraw your amendment. Sorry. Yes, indeed. Um, I'll, I'll not comment. Thank you, uh, Convener. And I do uh, press uh, Amendment 20. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. <laughs> Thank you. There were seven votes for, there were four votes against, so Amendment 20 is agreed. <clears throat> it has been a long morning. There are a series of votes. I would urge committee members to keep their attention for these few votes as we come to the end. So I call Amendment 21 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 20. Can I ask John Finney to move or not move, please? Move, can be no. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We're, we are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There were seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, Amendment 21 be agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 20. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 22. I should pay attention, criticise myself. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. I, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, Amendment 22 is agreed. <clears throat> I call Amendment 23 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 20. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for and four votes against, therefore Amendment 23 be agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 20. John Finney to move or not move? Excuse me, uh, move 24. I now call Amendment 24A in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 20. Jamie Green to move or not move on his behalf? Not moved. Thank you. Uh, therefore... Oh, I ask uh, John Finney to press or withdraw Amendment 24. Please. Press can be there. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. When we're not agreed, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for and four votes against, therefore Amendment 24 is agreed. I call Amendment 25 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 20. John <coughs> Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, Amendment 25 is agreed. I call Amendment 26 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are seven votes for and four votes against. Therefore, as tw Amendment 26 be agreed. I call Amendment 318 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 7. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Now, that is as far as we can go today. Um, and we will continue. Continue next week. Yes, Mr. Lyle. Yeah, uh, For the, the benefit of anyone watching, can I intimate again, convener, I can't make it next week and I have uh, been allowed off uh, next Wednesday. I don't think you've been and allowed my off. My substitute member will be here. I, I don't think you've been allowed off. I think, you, I, th I think you are going to be away, but the point is yeah. duly noted. And I would like to thank everyone for taking part in this session today. Could I remind uh, members that amendments to the remaining sections of the bill should be lodged by 12 noon on Thursday, the 20th of June, with the clerks in the legislation team. Thank you very much. And that concludes today's committee business. And I now close the meeting. <laughs>